Stay in Baltimore and Eric Garner in Staten Island to change police departments, change their training tactics, uh, go to the type of tactics that allow police officers to get out in the community more and to get to know people in the community uh, in ways that they don't usually have the time to do because they are so busy running from call to call. So there was an effort by the previous administration to bring both sides together, both the activists, uh, in some cases representing the black community, uh, as well as uh, police commanders, police leaderships in this country. President Obama brought them around a table in a forum in the White House, and they were hashing out these issues. And, and, and based on my research that I've done on this issue, these were tough conversations. Now, the Trump administration has taken a different approach to police reform in this country. They have recommended changes since the death of George Floyd, but there has not been this outreach to activists. There has been an outreach to the law enforcement community, which is staunchly supportive of this president, but there has not been this effort to bring both sides together to sort of calm the tensions. Uh, so while some people say that there has been dramatic change since Ferguson, body cameras, uh, more of an effort to be transparent after police involve shootings or excessive force cases, there are still many, as you will hear today from these speakers, who believe there is uh, so much more to do to bring racial equality and to reform police departments in communities across this country. Indeed. Uh, Jeff, well, we know you're going to be there uh, all day long. Appreciate your insight. You've done a lot of research, written a few books, so it's really, uh, we really appreciate having you. Thank you. All right, so don't forget that we will have live coverage of speeches from the March on Washington starting at 11 a.m. Eastern right here on CBSN. And still to come, the power of August. We'll preview the new CBSN special focusing on the powerful moments in American civil rights history that took place in the month of August. Uh, host Maurice Dubois joins us after the break, so keep it right here. You're streaming CBSN. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Ah, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative. Da, 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 da. And truly original That's reporting. Great. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday morning. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah, the more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. 
even really young kids are feeling what's going on right now. How should parents be talking to them about this whole question of racial justice? How do we embrace this moment and turn it into real change? What we really must focus on is moving from protesting to policy. Join Gail, Anthony, and Tony on CBS This Morning. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, anytime, anywhere. It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBSN Los Angeles, streaming 24-7. You can watch CBSN 24-7. I've got an amazing story to share with you. I understand you have some breaking news. How does it all play out? It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. August is hot. In fact, it's blazing hot. Maybe it's a coincidence. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's divine. The power of August brought us the women's suffrage movement. It brought us the March on Washington. It opened our eyes of the lynching of Emmett Till. Uh, it also opened our eyes up of the modern day uh, lynching uh, in Ferguson, Missouri. Emmett Till's death was a moment. It was a snapshot that galvanized millions of Americans. We will continue to battle this thing until every man, woman, and child in the United States, when he goes before a court of justice, will get justice. When Emmett Till was laid out in his casket, his mother insisted that it be an open casket, so she said that people can see what they did to him. We're part of humanity, and whatever humanity's problems are, they are ours, too. It's a basic American right that a citizen should have a right to an education. On August 28, 1963, the March on Washington took place. These expressions make it probably clear that this is a national issue. Let us not forget that we are involved in a serious social revolution. So you just saw a sneak peek of the new CBSN special. It's called The Power of August, and it really explores key civil rights moments in American history this month, the month of August. For more on this, let's bring in Maurice Dubois. He's anchoring the special. So thank you so much for joining us, Maurice. I think the first little clip in that, in what we just rolled, sort of says a lot about the month of August. The temperature is hot, but people are hot too. You know, in, in terms of, you know, people are angry. And we see sort of moment after moment that in August, that frustration and anger bubbles over. So I'm gonna, I'm not gonna go way back. I'm just gonna go a few years back. August of 2014, Michael Brown was killed by police. It set off widespread protests. What was the significance of that moment and how it sort of also plays into the aftermath of what we're seeing now this, in, in this summer, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and others who have died at the hands of police? I know, Anne-Marie, the list goes on and on. First of all, thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you, I am so proud to be associated with this particular program. It is moving, it's emotional, it's literally the best and worst of times of America over the past 65 years. You talk about the past six years and in 2014 when Michael Brown was killed, and I distinctly remember thinking as the protesters started filling the streets of our cities, New York in particular, as I was here at that time, and then Ferguson, obviously, and cities all around the country, this galvanizing of energy and the birth of the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, that's literally where this started. It started a new generation of protest, of activism, of engagement, of young people being involved in the protest for uh, equality. And it was also, you know, you think about Michael Brown, there was also um, Eric Garner in Staten Island, New York. There was Trayvon Martin down in Florida. So it was this national awakening to the way that the country has treated black men and black people in particular. And so I think, you know, that worst of times, best of times dichotomy that we talk about, it was, it was the birth of, of this activism and energy over something so awful and so uniquely American. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Maurice, you, you know, obviously, uh, because we as a network have been covering the path of destruction left by Hurricane Laura all through the Gulf Coast, uh, leaving thousands without power or running water. You will, of course, remember, as we all do, in August of 2005, Hurricane Katrina hit the same area. Remind our viewers what kind of impact this hurricane and this tragedy had on black Americans at the time, and more importantly, how the government responded. Yeah, it was another moment when it laid bare the way black Americans have been treated in this country. You'll remember 1,800 people and more were killed in Katrina, $165 billion in damage. And, you know, you can't prevent a natural disaster. Everybody grasps that. But it was the government response and the way it prepared. And it didn't really prepare and it didn't really respond uh, to the tragedy at hand. You remember Kanye West, you know, accusing George Bush, the president at the time, of not caring about black people. You remember him saying, Brownie, you're doing a heck of a job, despite the, the struggles that FEMA was having. You'll remember Ray Nagin, the mayor of New Orleans, struggling to even, uh, you know, to take care of his people. So what it did was it, it laid bare the way America looks at black people, because this was a monster tragedy. And yet all these people were left in, in, a, in a situation of chaos, of despair. I mean, the population of New Orleans div diminished by half at the time. It's since come back by about, I think, mm -hmm. you know, another quarter. But, you know, it was it was just, again, I say laid bare, but th this happens every few years, right? It lays bare the way America has treated black people, and that was um, no exception. There have been bright spots in August. August 6, 1965, the Voting Rights Act was signed into law. But then in 2013, the Supreme Court struck down some key, a key provision in that law, weakened it essentially, took the teeth out of it. Just can we talk a little bit about the significance of that law, what it meant, what this ruling meant for black Americans across the nation? Yeah, the Voting Rights Act, what a triumphant moment. John Lewis, right, uh, and, and, and all the civil rights activists back in the day. The Voting Rights Act required states with a history of voter suppression to get federal permission before they change any voting laws. Well, seven years ago, the Supreme Court narrowed decision five to four. And you remember John Roberts, the Supreme Court um, chief justice at the time, saying that we're past the time when the federal government needs to monitor the states. And so states were then given the ability to change voter laws without federal permission. OK, and so what we've seen, civil rights activists will tell you since then, is a tightening of restrictions on African-American voters and restrictive policies, right? So voter suppression is what they call it, and that's been the result. And so that, that is key right now um, in, in the election and, and going forward. Maurice, you know, we talk about the power of August, and I'm, like you, I'm so proud to be associated with this special, which is the very first uh, produced documentary from our new race and culture unit headed by Alvin Patrick. But, um, you know, it, it, I think that the, the key point that we should also make is that there have also been triumphant moments uh, in August, and Anne-Marie alluded to one of them, um, and we talk about that in the special as well. Yeah, the Voting Rights Act, a high point. Um, and, and in your piece, Vlad, which was beautifully done, by the way, seriously, kudos to you on that piece. So Emmett Till, 1955, the murder, it spawns the civil rights movement, right? You had um, Rosa Parks inspired to sit on the bus, uh, in the front of the bus, and then the Montgomery bus boycott, and Martin Luther King, and then the March on Washington, probably one of the the greatest moments uh, in American um, civil rights history, and the speech by Dr. King, you know, just really one of the main, uh, one of the one of the mountaintops in American history. And then, and then the election of Barack Obama in 2008 that showed Black Americans voting power. When you think about the the turnout of African Americans uh, for for the Obama elections, right? It was 65 percent in 2008, 66 percent in 2012. And then in 2016, African-American voter turnout was down to 59.5% or so. And so you saw the result of that. And so you look at the election landscape right now, right? Um, Kamala Harris is on the ticket for, with Joe Biden. There's no accident there, right? And, and the qualifications aside, but African-American. 
uh, trying, to, trying to get African Americans excited about the vote. And then you saw the Republican convention. You saw a whole lot of African Americans speaking, trying to reach out to this key voting block. There's, there's a margin there that's going to make the difference in November. So what you're hearing from civil rights activists is register and vote and do it early and get it done. That is a very strong message, uh, Maurice. And I always think, uh, uh, you know, when I think about the brutalization, the brutal killing of Emmett Till, and then I think uh, when Rosa Parks was asked why she decided to sit in the front of the bus, she said, I was thinking about Emmett Till. Uh, Maurice Dubois, thank you, my friend, very, very much. Yeah. Uh, it's really great to have you with us. Thank you, guys. The Power of August is an hour-long special looking back at the transformational moments in American civil rights history. It will premiere tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern and will air again at 11 p.m. and 2 a.m. right here on CBSN. And to learn more about the depth and the differences in the African-American and American experience, the totality of who we are as a country, you can visit cbsnews.com slash cbsvillage, where we report on a range of issues impacting diverse communities across the nation. President Trump heads to New Hampshire today for a rally, fresh off accepting the Republican nomination for president last night. Today's rally is scheduled for 6 p.m. Eastern time, and it will be held in a hangar at Manchester Boston uh, Regional Airport. The president has kept his eye on the Granite State after narrowly losing New Hampshire to Hillary Clinton in 2016. The latest CBS News Battleground tracker shows him trailing behind Joe Biden by 10 points ahead of November's election election. So for more on this, let us bring in Stephanie Murray. Stephanie, you're the author of the Massachusetts Political Playbook. So you are the one to talk about what's happening on the ground there. Um, what do we expect to hear from the president at this rally? I think tonight in New Hampshire, you can hear, you can expect to hear President Trump take some swings at Joe Biden. Um, the polling shows that Biden is ahead of Trump in New Hampshire, and it's the state that the president really wants to win in 2020 because he lost it so narrowly to Hillary Clinton in 2016. The New Hampshire primary was a big validator for Trump uh, four years ago, and then narrowly losing that state uh, in the general election. The campaign has had its eyes on New Hampshire for a couple of years now, saying that it was one of those purple states that was hoping to flip red. Uh, but Biden has a pretty significant lead there, so you can expect him to throw some punches at the former VP. Hmm. How is uh, President Trump hoping to appeal to voters there uh, after losing the state to Hillary Clinton back in 2016? You know, I, I think it's tough, and it's something that the president is dealing with all over the country. The election has really become all about the coronavirus pandemic, the economy, um, and what is going to happen with schools. Uh, he's endorsed a few uh, Republican candidates who are running in primaries in New Hampshire in September, so I'll have my eye on how those candidates do as well to kind of get sort of a litmus test on how uh, voters are feeling about President Trump and his endorsement and how they'll feel about him in November. That, well, that was going to be my question, because um, there are a primary election is going to be held uh, September 8th. Of course, it's a Tuesday. So you mentioned that the uh, candidates being endorsed by the president, you're going to be keeping a close eye on them. What are these key races? So uh, the races that I'm looking at are the governor's race. Um, the Republican governor, Chris Sununu, uh, I think he'll be fine in the primary, but I'm keeping my eye on him in November. And then there are a couple of primaries uh, for the Senate seat and one of the House seats. Um, uh, in CD1, represented by Chris Pappas, uh, there's the Trump-endorsed candidate and then another one running for Senate. As you know, nearly 40,000 voters have already cast their ballots for the primary, thanks to the temporary expansion of absentee voting, uh, of course, due to the coronavirus outbreak. So do you expect a similar response for the presidential election in November? You know, I think that this primary is something of a test run for how vote by mail is going to work. Based on all of the polling we've seen, vote by mail has been very popular among Democrats um, and Republican voters are a little bit more weary of it, uh, even though, you know, President Trump has raised a lot of questions about mail-in voting. but. Uh, kind of behind the scenes, his campaign or surrogates have been encouraging mail-in voting. Uh, here where I am in Massachusetts, uh, we have a primary in a few days. Over a million people have requested ballots to vote by mail. So all of these different states are planning their vote by mail program. Um, and it'll be interesting 
interesting to see how many people use that in November, especially if there's some sort of uh, COVID spike, uh, which experts have said may happen. Um, it may kind of discourage people from going to the polls and choose that vote by mail option instead. Yeah, we've been seeing those stark numbers, uh, those predictions uh, popping up. Uh, Stephanie Murray, uh, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right, we want to take you to our nation's capital uh, now, where thousands of protesters have gathered for a march on Washington. The goal, racial justice and police reform. Let's dip in. But also developed a list of federal and local demands that would save black lives. Please welcome Alaya Eastman. One of the millions of young black women who make up the backbone of the American progressive movement. Like too many of us, my journey of activism started by a senseless act of gun violence when a fellow student opened fire in my classroom in Parkland, Florida. As I laid beneath the lifeless body of my classmate Nicholas Dorat to survive, as bullets riddled my classmates, as my screams melted into the cries of the wounded, I was then born again with a voice that cannot and will not be muzzled. While the details of my story may be different from other impacted youth, my brush of death by a gun is experienced by, it is an experience that is shared by too many of our generation. I am not the first in my family to be affected by gun violence. My uncle Patrick was gunned down in the streets of Brooklyn, New York at the age of 18, just months after being beaten by NYPD who deemed his black body in a white neighborhood a threat. Gun violence is pervasive and extends well beyond high-profile mass shootings. This violence is not inherent or a coincidence. It is a result of poor choices made by policymakers that all too often have racial undertones associated with it. The flow of guns into already struggling communities just months after being beaten by NYPD who deemed his black body in a white neighborhood a threat. Gun violence is pervasive and extends well beyond high-profile mass shootings. This violence is not inherent or a coincidence. It is a result of poor choices made by policymakers that all too often have racial undertones associated with it. The flow of guns into already struggling communities is often facilitated by white gun store owners who look the other way as traffickers buy guns used to terrorize black communities. Gun violence extends beyond the path of a bullet and creates multi-generational cycles of poverty as well as social and economic injustices. Law enforcement has for years failed to prevent the flow of guns into black communities as well as perpetuated violence in these communities themselves. Studies show that persistent gun violence in poor communities of color directly results from centuries of entrenched disadvantages, economic deprivation, and racist policy making. In many ways, gun violence is the last domino to fall at the end of a long line of racism, trauma, and indifference. But this is not inevitable. Community-based intervention programs throughout the country have proven that holistic, culturally sensitive, embedded teams can start, stop violence before it starts. We demand funding for these programs. We've seen the shooting from my high school gain worldwide attention. But the mass shooting that happened in Southeast DC three weeks ago, where 17-year-old Christopher Brown lost his life and 20 people were, sh were wounded, got no attention. Be outraged equally for black lives. It is important that as I talk about gun violence, I address police violence. We must shift from a punitive to a rehabilitative model in the prison system. There is a need for a national conversation of defunding police departments and refunding our communities instead. We must reallocate those funds into schools, jobs, and needs for a comfortable life. We need to revisit the use force practices and eliminate conduct that places suspects at extreme harm once in custody. As has been established, officers nationwide lack accountability. For an officer who knows that he can kill an unarmed black man or woman and only get paid death duty as an assault, anything less than that is business as usual. We must change this reality and empower citizens of the communities being policed to hold their local forces accountable. It is important that we recognize that the systematic oppression that continues to marginalize our communities is not an accident. America was built on a system that is still doing its job. 
Police violence is gun violence, and gun violence is a leading cause of death for black youth. We demand to live in peace. We demand to live in, place, in spaces where the best of black culture can thrive, where black men are more likely to have a mortgage and a picket fence than a record, where black women are business executives and vice presidents, where our trans sisters and brothers don't fear being themselves. But this dream that I, that Rev O. Sharpton, that Martin Luther King III have for black Americans cannot be realized until we have a federal government with our best interests at heart. For our part, Brady and Team Enough are engaged in a campaign to remove barriers to, to casting a ballot, making vote by mail available to all, ensuring ballot drop boxes are distribute, distributed equitably, restoring the voting rights of Americans who have paid their debt to society. We have so much good trouble to get into. I want to thank the community organizers of National Action Network, and especially their organizer in chief, the Reverend Al Sharpton, and Martin Luther King III, for the work that they do, not just today, but every day, and giving us a place at the table. As I returned from Louisville yesterday, where Breonna Taylor was brutally killed by LMPD, it is still clear that black women are still unprotected. As I stand here in pain from the aftermath of tear gas and rubber bullets, I realize that black women are still the backbone of this movement. My name is Alea Eastman, a student at Trinity Washington University, executive council member of Brady's Team Enough, co-founder and core organizer of Concerned Citizens DC, a grassroots group of young black organizers demanding true liberation for black people. Thank you. Marcus W. King. He's the president of New Jersey's Teamsters Local 331. A second generation Teamster, King has been a member since 1983. After he was asked to join the International Brotherhood of Teamsters as a field representative, one of his assignments included Local 331. The members of the local asked King to stay on, and King was successful in being elected president in 2009, re-elected in 2012, 2015, and 2018. King has served on the UPS Supplement Negotiation Committee for Philadelphia Metro Area and the National Master Freight Supplement Panel. Please welcome Marcus W. King. Good morning. Thank you, Reverend Al Sharpton, Martin Luther King Jr. III, and the National Action Network for assembling us here today. This is an awesome brother event. Brothers and sisters, good morning. It's an honor to be with you. As the young lady just said, my name is Marcus King. I'm the director for the International Brotherhood of Teamsters Human Rights and Diversity Commission. And I bring you greetings on behalf of our General President, James P. Hoffa. The Teamsters Union have a long history of standing not only for members, but for those Americans who have been discriminated over and overlooked. For 57 years after the first march on Washington, the Teamsters have again stand with you proud to reaffirm our support for racial and economic equality in this country. The Teamsters brothers and sisters, black, white, men, women, all stood with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to fight for justice. And now we must finish the fight. We must finish this fight. We must complete the mission 
for genuine equality. There are forces out there working against us to dismantle the union and labor laws. They have circumvented civil rights laws in our courts. They have manipulated our elections to try to block our vote. They have denied this job promotion because of the color of our skin. They have stolen wages from us by perpetuating minimum wage standards that no one can survive on. Yes, they even are going after labor unions. They have tried to systematically strip away the voice to protect workers as we fight for fair wages, equal pay, good health care, and a decent pension for retirement. And now they're trying to separate American labor by putting a gap between the have and the have nots. As it gets wider and wider, just look at Jeff Bezos, what he made this year. Brothers and sisters, it's time for action. Words are not enough. We will not be ignored any longer. We can change it now. So there's three things that I'm going to ask you to do. One, lobby members of Congress to pass H.R. 71, the Justice and Policing Act, George Floyd Act. Two, lobby H.R. 4, the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act. But most important, number three, we must vote. This coming November, we must vote. We have to tell this country, take the knee off our necks. Use your voice for those who can no longer be with us. Make your voice count. Jacob Blaine, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, do it for my brother Teamster, Philando Castile, who was killed by a Minnesota police, or do it for you. Make your voice count. Make it better place for us and our children. Black lives do matter because our lives matter. Stay safe. God bless you. All of my brothers and sisters in the movement, Teamster Strong. My name is Marcus King, and I'm the director for Human Rights and Diversity for the Teamsters International Union. Thank you. Roscoff proudly co-authored the nation's first gay rights bill in 1970 and served as its chief lobbyist. In 2004, he formed the Jim Owls Liberal Democratic Club, which is a citywide LGBTQ organization serving all of New York City. New York Magazine dubbed him as Al Sharpton's ambassador to the gay community in the 80s, and he currently serves as secretary of the Civil Rights Museum built in Harlem, New York, under the leadership of Reverend Al Sharpton. Let's give him a round of applause. I'm here to tell everybody that the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community is part of this struggle. We join with Black Lives Matter. We march with you. We, we, we get arrested, we risk arrest, and we get brutalized in support. After all, the gay rights movement was formed because of brutality of the police in a bar known as Stonewall. Until the black community is recognized as an equal community, until the police harassment, the police belittlement, the police shootings, and the police killings, we will stand united. We are all one. We want you to know that we will continue demonstrating. We will continue marching. We will continue.
to protest. We will continue to upset the power structure. We will continue to risk arrest. We will continue to be arrested. We will be part of this movement and in all the demonstrations and protests in New York and across the country, you can see our rainbow flags and our rainbow banners. Black Lives Matter is one of the most important organizations and movement, one of the most important movements in this country and in history. I thank you all. I thank Reverend Al Sharpton and the National Action Network for putting this together and being such a good friend to the LGBT community. Together to victory and vote out the racist in the White House and vote out his entire administration and his supporters. Thank you. So we are watching uh, the March on Washington right now. We're going to just sort of switch over to uh, other cameras. Um, this is, uh, well, you're looking at thousands of people rallying at the Lincoln Memorial for racial equality. And it comes on the 57th anniversary of um, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. Uh, we have a list of speakers um, all day long. The expectation, I don't know how many people are here, but the expectation was about 50,000 people would be attending this rally and I think we can dip back in right now. We took a 750 mile a trek across the country to get here. Um, I'll let Frank speak on the journeys, uh, some of the things we face uh, during this journey. But I'd like to thank all our Facebook friends who cash tapped us. I'd like to thank our photographers. I'd like to thank our uh, videographers. I'd like to thank all the marchers who marched with us and all the caravan and the medic crews who came along with us. I love you and God bless you. How y'all doing out there? My name is Frank Nitty, all right? They only gave me two minutes, so I'm not gonna talk about my journey. I'm gonna talk about what I came here to talk about, all right? Now check it out, as activists around the country, we need to get organized. Every three months when a black person get killed, that shouldn't be the only time we find out about black people getting killed by the police. We need to get organized together as a nation of activists so we can call on each other whenever we need help. We need to demand change, not ask for change. They think this is a negotiation. This is not a negotiation. I came here to demand change. I'm tired. Are y'all tired? Because I'm tired. My, my, my grandsons ain't gonna be marching for the same stuff my my granddaddy marks for. This is the revolution, all right? We just marched 750 miles from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 24 days to get here because we're not gonna stop until we get changed. That's what we need in this country. All of y'all that came today, I know y'all been marching in y'all cities. I know y'all been marching. Don't stop marching. We gonna organize because they don't expect that. We gonna come together because they don't expect that. We gonna demand change because they don't expect that. We not gonna have our kids marching. This is it. We've been marching for the same stuff for 60 years. Black people shouldn't be marching for the same stuff Martin Luther King was marching for. I'm tired. I'm tired. And I'm tired of asking for justice. I just wanted to stop. We don't want justice. That's after a racist police do something to us. We need them out of the police. We need all these racist people gone. We need change. And we can get that by voting. Now, while we marched in 750 miles, everybody that came and chastised us, everybody that came with shotguns, everybody that came messing with us had Trump signs. Trump 2020. That's the new way that they exhibit racism in this country and hide behind it. So we got to vote Trump out of office, all right? So when it's time to vote, we going to vote. And if y'all see me up here, if you're an activist, stop me out there so we can organize. It's time. This is the revolution. This is the revolution.
Our next speaker is David Clooney. He's the executive director of the Black Economic Alliance, the nation's only coalition of business leaders and aligned advocates committed to economic progress and prosperity in the black community with a specific focus on work, wages, and wealth. Before joining BEA, David led the state and local government relations team at J.B. Morgan Chase & Company. He's a graduate of Howard University School of Law, where he was editor-in-chief of the Law Review and the University of Albany State University of New York and sits on the board of the National Urban League. Please welcome David G. Clooney. I'm David Clooney. I lead the Black Economic Alliance, a group of black business leaders and allies dedicated to improving work, wages, and wealth for black people. We know the 1963 March on Washington was a march for jobs and freedom. In over 50 years, the wealth gap between black and white Americans has not changed significantly. In fact, by some measures, it's even wider today. But we're at an inflection point. It may have taken 400 years, plus eight minutes and 46 seconds to get here, but there is an increasing recognition that systemic racism continues to oppress black people in every part of American life. So what do we do with this moment? Of course we need to continue to fight for social justice, but we also need to fight for economic justice from our elected leaders and in the business community. We need to fight for better work, wages, and wealth for black people. That's skills training for the future of work, closing the black-white pay gap, and building generational wealth for black families. Right now, we absolutely have to vote. Congress should pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act to ensure free and fair elections. And just like we're showing up to march across America, we have to show up and vote. Over 40 states will allow early voting this year, so vote early if you can. Make a plan and make sure your vote is counted well before Election Day. We owe it to the civil rights giants who marched, bled, and died for us. We owe it to the families of countless black people lost to unchecked institutional racism. We owe it to America to help her keep her promise to all of us. I am so inspired by the demand for justice that's emanating from every corner of America right now. We have to continue this march on every platform we have, in the streets, in the halls of Congress, in the corporate boardrooms, and with our vote, so we can finally achieve social and economic justice. Thank you. She's a brand builder, music lover, sport bike rider. Portia Taylor is the founder of Black Girls Ride, a magazine and community originally launched as a place for women of color who ride, which has since grown to include all women. What inspired her to launch Black Girls Ride was the lack of representation that she saw when she started riding, especially long distance, when not developing brand campaigns, spinning at the hottest parties, or on her way up to, quote, occupy the gym. Portia can be found rolling in her pink habaya. I know I said that wrong, I don't even ride. <laughs> and always living her best life. Please welcome Portia Taylor. Good afternoon. I'm Portia Taylor, and I'm here as a representative of Black Girls Ride. More than a magazine, we are a movement of women passionate about motorsports. Over 100 women rode across America to be with you here today. We are our ancestors' wildest dreams. Women of color on ground traveling across the land of the free. We are your mothers, your grandmothers, your aunts, your sisters, and your daughters. Our ride started Monday in Long Beach, California. As we rode through Texas, I thought about my soror, Sandra Bland, and how a simple traffic stop ended in her death. 
We all witnessed George Floyd's death as he cried for help, the heartbreaking death of Breonna Taylor as she slept in her home. And less than a week ago, Jacob Blake was shot seven times in the back and paralyzed. With each act of senseless violence, we feel a stirring in our collective soul. When a call to march was issued, we knew it was time to mount up. We packed up our bikes and rode thousands of miles in protest against police brutality. We ride unapologetically for black lives, and we raise our throttle hand in support of those on the front line of our struggle. We ride to ensure the freedom of our future leaders. We've come a long way, but our journey is not over. In November, black girls ride will wear our engines. We will lead the ride to the polls and fuel the ballot boxes of this nation to choose a leader that will provide the unity our country desperately needs. We invite you to join in this and vote like your life depends on it. Thank you. really needs no introduction and stays on the front line. Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. She's an activist, a legislator, a survivor, and the first woman of color to be elected to Congress from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Throughout her career as a public servant, Congresswoman Presley has fought to ensure that those closest to the pain are closest to the power, driving and informing policymaking. Prior to her being elected to Congress, she served on the Boston City Council for eight years and was the first woman of color elected to the council in its 100-year history. Please welcome Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. Good morning, beloved. Today, I am thinking of the ancestors, not just the ones recorded in our history books, but the ones omitted from those pages. The justice seekers, the freedom riders, the organizers, the community builders, every loved one that packed a brown bag lunch, led a freedom song, risked their life and livelihood, that Vaseline and elbow and sent up a prayer. Their sacrifice and self-determination shaped history and brought us to this moment. The truth of the matter is, we are because of them. We are black with a capital B. We are the manifestation of the movement. We are a symbol of social, political, and cultural progress. If my granddaddy, the Reverend E. James Eccles, were here, he would whisper in my ear and say, grandbaby, make it plain. And I intend to do just that, make it plain. We are in unprecedented, uncertain times. We are challenged by the state of the nation and the crisis we face, but the state of our movements, it is strong. And another world is possible. Yes, it is possible to legislate justice and accountability. People over profits, joy over trauma, freedom over fear. Yes, it is possible to write budgets that actually value black lives. If it feels unfamiliar, that's because it has never been done in America. We will meet the moment. We will work towards healing, justice, and collective liberation like our lives depend on it, because they do. We will march on, clear in our conviction, rooted in our faith, grounded in our history, intentional as we build. Let me make it plain. Black lives matter.
Speaker is Representative Adriano Espiat. Espiat proudly represents New York's 13th Congressional District, first elected to Congress in 2016. Espiat is serving his second term in Congress, where he serves as a member of the influential U.S. House Foreign Affairs Committee, the House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, and the House Small Businesses Committee. Throughout his tenure career in public service, the congressman has been a vocal advocate for protecting tenants, improving schools, and making serious, smart investments in economic development, job creation, environmental protection. Prior to coming to Congress, he served as a New York State Senator, during which he represented the neighborhoods of Marble Hill, Inwood, Washington Heights, Ham Hamilton Heights, West Harlem, Upper West Side, Hell's Kitchen, Clinton, and Chelsea. Please welcome U.S. Representative Adriano Espiat. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Reverend Al Sharpton. Thank you, National Action Network. Thank you all for being here on this great mor morning. I bring you greetings from Harlem, the capital of the African diaspora in the world, from East Harlem, the launching pad of the Latino experience in New York State from immigrant Washington Heights, Hamilton Heights, Inwood, and working class Northwest Bronx. Over 50 years ago, the great Martin Luther King Jr. and John Lewis stood here and shared their dreams with all of you. Today, as the first formally undocumented member of Congress, I stand here with you today to say that yes, I am a man, that yes, we shall overcome, that yes, si se puede, that yes, black lives matter, and that yes, without no justice, there will be no peace. We come here today burying the scars and the wounds of 400 years of struggle to say that whether your ancestors pick cotton or whether they cut sugar cane, we're all in the same boat right now. We must pass legislation to ensure that there is police reform. We must pass the pieces of legislation highlighted in the Harlem Manifesto against police brutality that are all included in the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act. Let's get rid of the chokehold. Let's get rid of the knee. We also most must pass the John Lewis Voters' Rights Advancement Act to ensure that we all be able to vote. We must enact criminal justice reform. Let's do away with the death penalty. Let's do away with solitary confinement. Let's do away with mandatory minimums. I am a man. We shall overcome. Si se puede. No justice, no peace, and black lives matter. God bless you and keep the faith. Next is Representative Charles Booker, a 36-year-old state legislator born in Louisville, Kentucky. 
He successfully ran for State House in Kentucky in 2018, becoming the youngest African American in the House in more than 90 years, where he fought com for common sense gun safety reform, prescription drug cost relief, voter protection and restoration in support of labor unions, for economic justice, against racial injustice, and more. Representative Booker recently founded Hood to the Holler, a 501c4 to capture the energy and infrastructure he built in his run to continue to build power, work on voter regi registration, and more, and to help positively transform our future. Please welcome Representative Charles Booker. We stand here in the legacy of the dream, the dream that Dr. King lifted up that Whitney Young pushed for, that Maddie Jones fought for, that my granddad, Lindsey E. Hearn Sr. demanded. We're here today because we know that dream is not done. Because although they marched for us then, the cries we're hearing across the country right now, from Kenosha to Kentucky, from the hood where I'm from, to the hollers in Appalachia, to everywhere in between, those cries let us know we have more marching to do. And it is in this moment where we must rise up together. Because listen, we are built for this moment. We are on the shoulders of giants, but we must step off of those shoulders and lead ourselves. We are the dream, but we must turn that dream into demands. Demands for real justice. Demands for humanity. Demands for accountability, demands for an end to poverty, demands for an end to racism. And I am a living witness as the youngest black state legislator in Kentucky since the first one. And yes, I did stand up to run against Mitch McConnell. I am a personal witness that we are ready for this moment. We're built for the work we must do. And if we come together, all of us, if we stand united, if we march together, if we bend that arc together, there is nothing we can't do. There is no mountain we can't move. And there is no root of racism we cannot pull up. So we got to do it right now. We got to do it yesterday, so we definitely got to do it now. And I stand here as a young man in the legacy of a giant Congressman John Lewis who said 57 years ago some words that still ring true right now. We have to lift our voices together and say to America, wake up, wake up America, because we can't stop, we cannot quit, and we cannot be patient. Let's win together, let's fight together, let's transform our future. Brianna, I'm representing you right now. Thank you all. Next, we have Tyleek McMillan. He serves as the National Director of Youth and College Engagement and is a policy advisor for the National Action Network. A recent graduate of North Carolina A&T State University, Tyleek is a proud member of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity, the Ada Chapter, and hopes to one day serve as a legislator on the Hill. Please welcome Tyleek McMillan. I give honor to the conveners, my boss and mentor, Reverend Al Sharpton, and Martin Luther King III. I also want to recognize the young leaders standing behind me from NAND Youth Huddle and NAND Collegiate. We find ourselves here in the spirit of John Lewis making good trouble, necessary trouble, because the soul of our democracy is depending on it. We're not here to ask for justice. We're not here to negotiate justice, but we are here to demand justice. Far too many times we have been cut out. Far too many times we have been budgeted out, counted out, resourced out. 
It's time for legislators to invest in education. It's time for legislators to invest in mental health services. It's time to invest in communities. And I love my 1891. It's time to invest in historically black colleges and universities. Because we deserve, we don't deserve just a half a dollar. We don't just deserve the quarter of the dollar, but we deserve the whole dollar. Dr. King spoke about the check that bounced in the Bank of Justice. And we've come to let the teller know at the bank that this check better not, better not bounce. Because we will march and we will fight because that's what we deserve. In the words of Dr. King in closing, and again, we come to cast the check, a check that, that, that is willing to demand the riches of freedom and security of justice. Thank you. No justice. No peace. I hear you back there. No justice. No justice. That's just to echo you. Next up, we have Janet Moriga. As someone who has experienced the promise of the American dream firsthand, Janet has devoted her career in public service to opening the door to that dream to millions of American families. As a key figure in the Latino community, she continues this mission as president and CEO of Unidos US, a large national Hispanic civil rights and advocacy organization in the US. Welcome her to the stage. Hello, hola. My name is Janet Merguia and I'm president and CEO of Unidos US the largest Latino civil rights and advocacy organization in the country. I want to tell you why I am here. I am here because we have stood and always will stand with Reverend Sharpton and Martin Luther King III and our brothers and sisters in the black community until systemic and institutional racism in our society is eradicated. I am here because 25 percent of my community is Afro-Latino, so we don't just empathize, we identify with the black community. I am here because we need law enforcement to get their knees off the necks of our black and Latinx young men. I am here because what we have seen in Kenosha, Wisconsin this week, a man shot in the back and paralyzed, peaceful protesters shot and killed by white nationalist vigilantes as the police have turned a blind eye and silence from the man who holds the highest office in the land. That is immoral and unacceptable. I am here because our communities are bearing the brunt of a pandemic, both in lives and livelihoods, that is only getting worse yet. I am here because we have in common what we have in common is far greater than what divides us. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote to Cesar Chavez in 1966, our separate struggles are really one, a struggle for freedom, for dignity, and humanity. 
I am here because we must support the young people of every background here as they rise up, make their voices heard, and tell those of their generation about the America that they want to see. Because we must reject bigotry and hate and insist that our country live up to its ideals and the values that we share. I am here because I am standing on the shoulders of giants like Congressman John Lewis to say, your fight is my fight. Tu lucha es mi lucha. I am here because black lives matter. Si se puede, adelante. Muchísimas gracias. Next, we have Reverend Dr. Richardson, who serves on the board of several corporations and national organizations and is currently chairman of the board for the National Action Network. Reverend Dr. W. Franklin Richardson is pastor of the historic Grace Baptist Church in Mount Vernon, New York. He leads the largest African-American church in Westchester County, with a membership base of over 3,000 parishioners. Despite the interaction with U.S. presidents and heads of state, he has made sure to use the power of the pulpit to lift up local issues in the Mount Vernon area and nationwide. Dr. Richardson believes that grace must be at the vanguard of liberation and empowerment of African American people through our Christian faith. Please welcome Reverend Dr. W. Franklin Richardson. Good afternoon. Let's give ourselves a celebration. Look at how we've turned out in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of all that's going on. This is important to us. We lay ourselves on the line because this is important. On behalf of the members of the board of National Action Network, I want to thank all of the various organizations who have collaborated with us to bring this to pass. We celebrate the great leadership of our President Reverend Al Sharpton and Martin Luther King III having convened us together. But our coming together for the speeches and the rhetoric of the moment will be meaningless if we do not leave here and activate and get involved and fight the fight and vote and encourage those who are not. We are at a crossroads, a crossroads in American history. We're at the intersection of parish or promise. If we fail to deliver in November, we will perish. If we fail to bring out our votes, we will not enjoy what we have struggled from. We are at a moment when all that we have fought for, all that our forefathers and mothers have died for, is at risk of being lost. Blood that's been shed for our freedoms is on the line, and we cannot perish. We must stand up. We must fight. We must engage every resource that we have. We still believe in America's promise. Not only are we on the precipice of perishing, but we're on the precipice of realizing the promise. And the promise is a nation where every person, every person, black or white, yellow, red, male, female, LBGT, every, every dimension of our humanity is in the promise of a great America. And so I challenge us all to believe in a better day, to make the sacrifices, to make sure we go back to our cities and knock on doors and call our friends, because this will be a sham if we fail to bring out the vote on November the 3rd. This will be mockery if we do not deliver ourselves to the polls. This will be a disgrace if we fail 
able to engage our resources to deliver on our own behalf and our forefathers and mothers who lay in the cemeteries will want to turn over in their graves if we fail to deliver in this moment and grasp what they fought for. God bless you. Let's go. Let's get this done. We're able. We're powerful. Use the UR code that's on the screen that talks about the black church 75, vote 75. All of us must be engaged. God bless you, and I look to see you in the near future at the Victory Celebration. God bless you. Next up, please welcome civil rights activist Maya Berry. She's the executive director of the Arab American Institute. Please welcome Maya Berry. You guys look amazing. Reverend Al Sharpton, Martin Luther King III, thank you for your leadership. To the Action, National Action Network, thank you for convening us today. To the families, who've lost loved ones to racist violence. I am so sorry for the pain you have been forced to endure. I'm humbled to stand and march alongside you today and every day. My name is Maya Berry and I'm the Executive Director of the Arab American Institute. On behalf of 3.7 million Arab Americans across the country, I stand here today with you in defense of black lives. We do so because it is right, and regrettably, because it is necessary to declare that black lives matter. We do so because we understand that until the killing of black men, women, and children stops, until systematic racism and anti-blackness is addressed, the America we all desire cannot be realized. For each life taken, each family destroyed, each neighborhood brutally patrolled, and for each protester taking to the streets to demand that all this stop, targeted by the same system of policing, justice will not be served by reforming tactics or trainings. Here's the simple truth. It's been 168 days since Breonna Taylor was killed in her own home. No charges have been filed. The system is not broken. It is working as it was designed, and we must change it. Today, we must recommit to defend black lives, to end police brutality, and the racist system that upholds it. We must recommit to fight voter suppression and the Im impact of a politicized decennial census like we have never seen. Just as the 1963 march and the mass demonstrations in communities across the country shepherded the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, we must not stop until we have secured the passage of the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act the Khaled Jabara and Heather Heyer No Hate Act, and the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Just as matter is the minimum, these important legislative priorities must be where we start. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Jamal Bryant. He's a visionary, civil rights activist, community organizer. Dr. Jamal Harrison Bryant combines sound biblical teaching, business acumen, and political insight to propel the body of Christ to action and greater levels of faith. 
His ability to reach across social, economic, and political barriers has helped people not only experience the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ, but to activate success in their everyday lives. His ministry has become an incubator for entrepreneurs, homeowners, and like Dr. Bryant, is a senior pastor of New Birth Missionary Baptist Church in Lithonia, Georgia. Please welcome Dr. Jamal Bryant. To our convener, organizer, and visionary, the man who God has anointed for this hour, Reverend Al Sharpton, uh, we thank him for his courage and for his faith and for his distinction, as well as his commitment to civil rights down through the years. Brothers and sisters, not since 44 BC, when Marcus Aurelius Junius Brutus led 59 accomplices to stab Julius Caesar in the back. Has there been such a heinous crime as the slaying of Jacob Blake? Seven times they shot him in the back. And today, while it is that you stand, Jacob finds himself paralyzed from the waist down. Not from these steps, but Dr. King said that we as a people should not find ourselves caught in the paralysis of analysis. In other words, our coming together is in vain if we just talk about the problems, but don't chart a course towards the solution. It's Harriet Tubman who said, I freed thousands of slaves, but I would have freed hundreds more had they known they were slaves. I only thought about that when I saw the slaves on TV this week endorsing Donald Trump. I said, if only they knew they were slaves, they could have been rendered free. We cannot remain paralyzed. We can't be paralyzed wondering whether or not we're going to support the very first black female vice president in the United States. Don't tell me about what it is that she did in the past and you not talk about what she wants to do in America in the future. She wants to make sure that we get rid of privatized prisons, that there are no more mandatory minimums, and marijuana is no longer an illegal substance. We cannot be paralyzed knowing that she graduated just a few miles from here, from the original HU. And those of us who are products of HBCUs, you ought to be making some noise right now, knowing what it can de de develop and what it can deliver. We cannot be paralyzed. We cannot allow white evangelicals to paralyze us, saying that they cannot support our agenda because they're for pro-life. Don't tell me you're for pro-life and white evangelicals are silent when black people are dying in the street like dogs. We cannot be paralyzed. The black church, you cannot be paralyzed saying that you're not going to support Black Lives Matter because of three fearless black sisters who happen to be lesbian. We've got to love our LBGTQ community, realizing that those are our sons and those are our daughters. We cannot be paralyzed. We cannot be paralyzed into believing Mr. Jones' water is colder. This is the time where we've got to support black businesses because too many of them are closing down because of COVID-16-19 not because they don't have adequate service, but because they don't have adequate support. But what America has to know about the tenacity of black people is that even when you render us paralyzed, we still know how to crawl. And on November 3rd, no matter what you do, we gonna crawl to the polls. If you take away the mailbox, we still going to crawl. You take away the polling stations away from our community, we still going to crawl. We going to sing the original gangster rap music. Before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go on to my Lord and be free. We still going to crawl. 
There is something about us that understands that we stand today with our brother Jacob, realizing that even if we find ourselves paralyzed and you force us to crawl, we are like butterflies because butterflies only have two options. They crawl and then they fly. And we understand in this hour, this is the hour for black people to fly. Maya Angelou said, you can write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. But still, like dust, we rise, we rise, we rise. And if you don't know Maya Angelou, the least you can do is loan the Migos. And black people from here until November 3rd, we got to walk it like we talk it. We got to keep moving until our generation takes the baton, changes the country, and makes America great for the very first time. Black people, rise up and accomplish what you will. to be a congresswoman. I'm a black mother who happens to understand that black lives do matter every single day of my life. Standing on these historic steps, grabbing on to the history of what the Lincoln Monument means to all of us who have a birthright in this nation to be able to live in dignity, I understand the words of Dr. Martin Luther King who said that the Negro people have been given a bad check a check which has come to be marked insufficient funds. Today we stop the insufficient funds and we put money in the bank because we've got to heal this nation. And so I say to you why we can't wait. Why we can't wait when those assigned to protect and serve are able to grab the t-shirt of a black man named Jacob and point a gun in his black skin and shoot seven times. Why we can't wait? Why we can't wait when those who are assigned to protect and serve can take Big Floyd, put a knee on his neck and say, I can't breathe. And then we know that we have to change this nation when we have Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner and Michael Brown and many others. And so today we come to acknowledge that we ask America not to fear us. We ask you not to send tweets that we are attacking you as a mob because the militia walks around freely and shoots us without anyone's concern. And so we are standing here today to say why we can't wait. We want an America that will stomp out the divisiveness, the intimidation and the threat we want a White House who stands as a healer in chief. 
who understands black mother's pain and understands your pain. And then, of course, we want to make sure, and we want to make sure that as we do this, we know that H.R. 40 is intertwined with the bill I helped write, which is H.R., the bill of George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. And so here we are today asking the question, how did this happen? Because of institutional racism. And I'm here to tell you that we must have the commission to study and develop, as my brothers and sisters have said, reparation proposals. We must answer the call of institutional racism. We have got to make sure that the social, economic, psychological, scientific, and educational government-sanctioned institutional racism stops right now. And as I told a 12-year-old, as I walked and told Martin Luther King's third daughter, that now, today, this attack on us as people of color who died on the battles of warfare, who have died on the streets for civil rights, it will stop today. Thank you, Reverend Sharpton and the National Action Network for understanding the importance of the Congress with over 150 co-sponsors in the House passing H.R. 40. We will heal the nation, but we will not stop until the nation knows Black Lives Matter and reparations are passed as the most significant civil rights legislation of the 21st century. Now is the time why we can't wait. Now, let's hear it for Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. Reparations now. Our next speaker from Ohio is a powerhouse who stands with the people, serving as vice chair of the Congressional Black Caucus and first ever chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Subcommittee a sought-after public speaker and previously recognized as one of Ebony Magazine's 150 most powerful African Americans in the United States. She has written 93 pieces of legislation and co-sponsored over 1,600 bills. She is calling on Congress to recognize racism as a national crisis. And we got a Delta up here now, Delta Sigma Theta sorority. We have a lot of AKAs. Any Deltas here? And she's also a member of the Lynx. Please welcome Congresswoman Joyce Beatty. Thank you, thank you. I am joined by members of the powerful Congressional Black Caucus. We are here today because people died and were denied civil and economic rights. We are here today because 57 years ago, people marched for jobs and freedom and stood here with members of Congress and Martin Luther King. We are here today because George Floyd had a knee on his neck. Eight minutes, 46 seconds. Black Lives Matter. We are here, and I stand representing the Congressional Black Caucus, 54 members strong, who understand silence is not an option because black people face a symbolic chokehold every time we walk, speak up, shop, jog, drive, and yes, breathe. So we must tear down the walls of injustice. I am standing here and saying as Martin Luther King Jr. said, 
in America, a riot is the language of unheard people. And what is it that America has failed to hear? Promises and freedom and justice for all. Say their names, Ahmad, Brianna, George, Jacob, and the list goes on. Black Lives Matter. So let us pass the George Ford Justice in Policing Act. No more immunity for officers who look boldly into cell phone cameras as they kill our brothers and sisters. Mandatory data bases. Tamar Rice would have lived to see his 18th birthday. A ban on chokeholds and no knock warrants. Eric Garner and Breonna Taylor would still be alive today. We are pushing to recognize racism as a national crisis. We are fighting for jobs, housing relief, access to capital, and a reparations bill. No, it was the black men, the brothers of the Congressional Black Caucus who wrote the First Step Act. Know that it is a powerful black man in leadership who leads the John Lewis voting rights legislation. Demand, demand, demand the Senate to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act that restores justice, dignity, and equal access to the ballot box. I say to you, stand with us and stand with the Reverend Al Sharpton and the National Action Network for this march and demanding that we get people registered to vote and that we vote, that we complete our census, say it with me, go vote, go vote, go vote, go vote. And let me say, tell them to get their knees off of our necks. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And yes, I'm Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, and I approve this message. Thank you to Congresswoman Beatty. As we said before, going back to 1963, organized labor has been a part of this. Here is the president of the 1.7 million member, American Federation of Teachers, AFL-CIO, which represents teachers, paraprofessionals, school-related personnel, higher education faculty and staff, nurses, and other healthcare professionals local, state, and federal government employees, and early childhood educators. Please welcome the President of the American Federation of Teachers, Randy Weingarten, and she'll be joined on stage by Everett Kelly of the American Federation of Government Employees, and our brother Ken from the International Union, Ken Rickmadian of the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades. You all welcome them as they come. Organized labor, y'all. Give them a round of applause. Okay. Everett Kelly. Good evening, brothers and sisters. I want to thank uh, Nan and Reverend Al Shopton, Martin Luther King III, for convening this march. I'm here today to represent 700,000 men and women making up AFGE. American Federation of Government Employees. It is an honor to be here. We are a diverse union. We're from all across the country, all ages, all abilities. We provide every single type of service to the American public. We, what unites us? Well, what brings us together is one big labor union. FGE, we believe in fairness. We believe in due process. 
FG believes that every American deserves a good job and every American deserves decent pay and full benefits. Every single person deserves that. FG believes in universal health care. We believe in universal housing, universal education, universal and equal justice under the law. We believe in the VA system, Social Security, and all the programs of the federal government that make people live better. We believe that the government should be a force for good, that the government should protect us and not scare us, not suppress us. So we are here today to let you know that we will stand with you. Can we do this together? Can we do this together? together. If we can do this together, let me hear you say together. When I was a little boy, I used to hear my grandmother say that I don't feel no ways tired. I didn't understand it then, but I sure understand it now. I don't feel tired. I'm ready to march. I'm ready to move. I'm ready to make a difference. Let's change this country. Thank you. Kendrick Median from IUPAT. IUPAT is in the house. Where are you at? Somebody say something. I'm Ken Rick Maiden, General President of the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades. We're a building trades union. You may think it's unusual for us to be here, but with me, growing up with a father, with a mother who looked like me, black lives matter, don't they? Black lives matter? Black lives matter. I stand on the shoulders of my father and all black tradesmen who fought for better wages and conditions. Without their fight, I wouldn't be here today. Recently, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of IUPAT Local 1332. You may not think much about that. That's one of our unions that was a traditional African-American union, formed over 100 years ago because they couldn't be in the regular union. But 100 years later, still up and fighting in a part of our organization. This is an opportunity for us because when I see the street, I don't just see people who look like me. I see America. And this is our opportunity to go forward and our opportunity to grow and our opportunity to have the country that has the vision that we have. All lives matter, but black lives matter on top. Black Lives Matter first. Somebody say it, it's easy. Black Lives Matter. Seven bullets in a man's back at point range. A knee pressed into a man's neck for eight minutes. How much pain must black people endure? When will justice prevail? When is enough enough? There is pain in this country, in Louisiana and Texas, after, after another hurricane, in California, in the midst of raging fires, across the country, Donald Trump, with 180,000 people dead from COVID. And in so many families' hearts, over the shooting of Jacob Blake, there is pain. So, Reverend Sharpton, how many times over how many decades have I and my union joined in this journey for justice? The 63 March started as a labor march for jobs and justice. A. Philip Randolph and Byron Rustin invited Martin Luther King Jr. to speak that day. And King said, we've come to dramatize a shameful condition. That shameful condition, prejudice, discrimination, economic inequality has not been cured. It's been metastasized. Underfunded schools, voter suppression, substandard housing, health care and transportation, insufficient wages, high unemployment, discriminatory policing, mass incarceration, black Americans, who whether from their higher rate of deaths from asthma or from COVID have been struggling to breed long before Eric Garner and George Floyd were suffocated at the hands of authorities. Justice 
and freedom must apply to all. The fight for opportunity and freedom must be all of our fights. And those of us who are white, we need to be real allies, real listeners, and real supporters. My synagogue's credo is the psalm, and I quote, that the stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. There is room for all of us, but we must call out those who cling so tightly to their privilege that is an oppressive tool against equality. So, my friends, my colleagues, November 3rd is coming. We need to get in good trouble. We need to vote. We need to have hope. We need a president who will sign the bills that the House has passed to make this country more fair, more just, more equal. That is our job this day and every day. Thank you. And then I also, as you all know, need to recognize the Postal Workers Union. All right, all right, no time, no time, no time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Kids, organized labor. Let's hear it for organized labor. Give them a round of applause. No time for them to speak, but the Postal Workers Union is in the house. Pray for our postal workers. Our next speaker in the Obama administration served as Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, Secretary of Labor, and now today he is the chair of the Democratic National Committee. Our friend and brother, please welcome Tom Perez. All right. All right. Good afternoon. Thank you, Reverend Sharpton and Martin Luther King III for your extraordinary leadership. Thank you to the National Action Network. Folks, I live in Maryland. We lost a remarkable person last year when my fellow Marylander and mentor, Elijah Cummings, passed away. And before he passed away, he reminded us all of our civic duty. He said, when we're dancing with the angels, the question will be asked, what did we do to make sure we kept our democracy intact? Did we stand on the sidelines and say nothing? Or did we fight back? Did we fight back for justice? Did we fight back for equality? Did we fight back for black lives? By being here today, you are answering all those questions with a resounding yes. We are all fighting back. But our fight cannot end here. Just as we march to this mall, we must march to Congress, to the United States Senate in particular, to demand passage of the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act and the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act. Just as we march to this mall, we must march to the ballot box or the mailbox to demand the leadership we deserve. And we must exercise the right that protects all others, the right to vote. As you well know, our nation is hurting right now. Our African-American communities are hurting. We're hurting from a pandemic that has taken 180,000 lives, hurting from an economic crisis that has cost millions of jobs, from a climate emergency that threatens the air we breathe and the water we drink hurting from an epidemic of violence and racism, a cancer of the soul. We're hurting from a knee on their neck, a bullet in their back, hurting from leadership that treats them like their lives don't matter. President Lincoln, you would not recognize today's Republican Party. Our African-American brothers and sisters are not alone. Dr. King spoke of the inescapable network of mutuality. In this moment of crisis, so many Americans are bound together in the mutual struggle for justice, dignity, and opportunity from the Native American tribes confronting the scourge of COVID and the delay of their stimulus funding 
to Latinx children being separated from their parents at the border, to Asian Americans facing hate-fueled attacks, to working families across this country struggling with poverty. We can change all of this. With the light, right leadership, we can heal our wounds. We can turn hardship into hope, despair into dreams. We can advance racial equality and restore the soul of our nation. But only if we do it together. Movements are built by the many, not the few. They're built by the hard and unglamorous work of grassroots organizing. They're built, in the words of the late, great Julian Bond, by the marchers whose feet have grown tired, whose voices have gone hoarse, whose shirts have stained with sweat and dirt and blood. John Lewis, as you know, left us with these marching orders. So go to IWillVote.com, IWillVote.com, check your registration status, tell your friends, family, and neighbors to make a plan to vote. Remember, November 3rd is the last day to vote, but it's not the first day to vote. Make a plan. Get out there. Do not let your voice go unheard. Do not let your voice go uncon un uncounted. This is the most important election of our lifetime. And make no mistake, you have the power to decide the outcome. Thank you very much. Today, we commemorate the 57th anniversary of the historic March on Washington for jobs and freedom. I was born into an activist family with my parents, my aunts and uncles pushing me in a stroller through Bay Area streets marching for justice in the years following the March on Washington. This moment is a reminder that we must always honor the sacrifice of the leaders who made that march happen. From the names we know, like Randolph and Farmer, Young and King, to everyone who worked behind the scenes and sacrificed quietly but profoundly, far from the lights of history. I have to believe that if they were with us today, they would share in our anger and frustration as we continue to see black men and women slain in our streets and left behind by an economy and justice system that have too often denied black folks our dignity and rights. They would share our anger and pain, but no doubt they would turn it into fuel. They would be lacing up their shoes, locking arms, and continuing right alongside us to continue in this ongoing fight for justice. Thankfully, we don't have to wonder if we are making them proud because a giant from that march and the civil rights era of that day John Lewis, he lived to tell us how we're doing. In his parting essay, he wrote to all of us who hoped to carry his legacy, quote, in the last days and hours of my life, you inspired me. You filled me with hope about the next chapter of the great American story when you used your power to make a difference in our society. For Congressman Lewis, the brutal murder of Emmett Till is what shook loose the activist inside him. It was the start of a lifelong journey towards service and driving change, the same journey that countless young leaders are building upon as we speak. As John put it, Emmett Till was my George Floyd. He was my Rayshard Brooks, Sandra Bland, and Breonna Taylor. The road ahead, it is not going to be easy. But if we work together to challenge every instinct our nation has to return to the status quo and combine the wisdom of longtime warriors for justice with the creative energy of the young leaders today, we have an opportunity to make history right here and right now. So thank you so much for inviting me to celebrate with you Let's march on in the name of our ancestors and in the name of our children and grandchildren. Thank you. Let's hear it for Senator Kamala Harris. Our next speaker is one of the legacy original organizations that was here in 1963 in the person of Whitney Young. Please welcome the former mayor of New Orleans the president and CEO of the National Urban League, Mark Morrell. Black Lives Matter. 
I want to thank Reverend Al Sharpton and the National Action Network, my friend and brother, as well as Martin Luther King III for assembling us here on August 28th in the year 2020. In 1963, courageous men and women descended on this site, led by six legacy civil rights organizations, including the National Urban League. At that time, the National Urban League was led by one of the great Americans of the 20th century, Whitney M. Young, Jr. He stated from this very place at that time and on that day, on August 28, 1963, that our civil rights, our voting rights, our rights to human dignity were not negotiable. We have come back on August 28th in the year of 2020, in this 21st century, to say today that our fight for racial justice is not negotiable. We're here today to say that transforming our criminal justice system and purging it of mass incarceration and systemic racism is not negotiable. That protecting our sacred right to vote from suppressors, be they legislators, be they presidents, be they Russians, is not negotiable. That defending our right to a living wage so that every American can live in dignity is not negotiable. That dislodging structural racism that infects every institution in American life is not negotiable. That equitably funding all of our schools so all of our children can learn and providing them with computers and broadband connectivity and they can live and thrive with their God-given talents is not negotiable. That a fair and accurate census so that all of us are counted in accordance with the Constitution is not in 2020 negotiable. That eliminating the structural and shameful disparate impact of COVID-19 in 2020 is not negotiable, that reforming police, both police policies and police culture, and reallocating funding to summer jobs for youth, to mental health services, to homeless services, and to end the violence against our black man is not negotiable. Hands up, I can't breathe. Hands up, don't shoot. In 1963, when they gathered on this site, brothers and sisters, just a few weeks before they gathered, that great civil rights leader, Medgar Evers, was assassinated on the front lawn of his home in Jackson, Mississippi. At that time, they were fighting a poll tax, a literacy tax, a literacy test, I should say, that did everything possible to prevent us from voting. In 2020, we come here when the very success of 1963, the Voting Rights Act, has been gutted by the Supreme Court. We come in 2020 where Jacob Blake and George Floyd and Eric Garner and Tamir Rice and Trayvon Martin and Sandra Bland and too many black men and women, Breonna Taylor, have died or been disabled at the hands of the police. So we're here to make some demands. Number one, we want the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act to pass now, not tomorrow, not next week, not next year. Say it, pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Number two, no, number two, we want to pass the HEROES Act. Number three, we want to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. And number four, we want to pass H.R. 40 to look at reparations in this country. November 3rd, we will vote. We will vote. So we will vote. We have to go by might, by force. We have to walk.
walk, if we have to run, if we have to, we will vote. Let's hear it for our brother Mark Morial of the Urban League. NUL.org. All right. Here to introduce the man who is the namesake of the person who spoke here August 28, 1963. Here to introduce one of our men of the hour, Martin Luther King III, is none other than the congressman representing the 9th Congressional District of Texas, Congressman Al. Green. Thank you, everyone. It is now my honor to introduce a man whose name is synonymous with the civil rights, human rights movement. A man whose father stood here 57 years ago. A man who followed his father's footsteps, and I was there with him to India where he traced the steps of Gandhi. A man who understands that this is a full-time job. He's not a part-time freedom fighter. He's not an everyday freedom fighter. He's an all-the-time freedom fighter. I'm here to introduce a man who's a Morehouse graduate, a man who knows what it feels like to suffer the pains associated with the human rights movement. When he lost his father at the age of 10, he could have given up, but he didn't. He stayed in and he has fought the good fight. I'm here to introduce the Honorable Martin Luther King III. Would you show him some love, please? If you believe in liberty and justice for all, stand up and show him some love. If you believe in government of the people, by the people, stand up and show him some love. Show Martin some love. Show his father some love, his mother some love, his wife Andrea some love, his daughter Yolanda some love. Show them some love. God bless you. God bless the King family. Good afternoon. I am so honored to be here, but before I say something, I want you to hear from the future of our nation. The only granddaughter of Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King, my daughter and Andrea's daughter, Yolanda Renee King. Should I really do this? Okay. Some of you may remember that two years at the March for Our Lives, I said, spread the word. Have you heard? All across the nation, we are going to be a great generation. That was in 2018. I didn't know what would hit us in 2020 a pandemic that shut our schools and put our young lives on hold, more killings of un unarmed black people by police, attacks on our right to vote, more killing, oh wait, the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression that we learned about in school, and more extreme weather than ever before. But great challenges produce great leaders. We have mastered the selfie and TikToks. Now we must master ourselves. Less than a year before he was assassinated, my grandfather predicted this very moment. He said that we were moving into a new phase of the struggle. The first phase was the civil rights, and the new phase is genuine equality. Genuine equality is why we are here today and why people are coming together all across the world, from New Zealand to New Jersey. He 
forget the days of the of Montgomery. We must not forget the sit-ins movements. We must not forget the Freedom Rides, the Birmingham Movement, and Selma. Papa King, we won't! My generation has already taken to the streets peacefully and with masks and socially distanced to protest racism. And I want to ask the young people here to join me in pledging that we have only just begun to fight and that we will be the generation that moves from me to we. We are going to be the generation that dismantles systemic racism once and for all, now and forever. We are going to be the generation that calls a halt to police brutality and gun violence once and for all, now and forever. We are going to be the generation that reserves climate change and saves our planet once and for all, now and forever. And we are going to be the generation that ends poverty here in America, the wealthiest nation on earth, once and for all, now and forever. We are the great dreams of our grandparents, great grandparents, and all our ancestors. We stand and march for love, and we will fulfill my grandfather's dream. So, show me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Show me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Show me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. One last time. Show me what democracy looks like. This is what Show them. A proud dad. Let me thank God that we've been able to assemble today and to thank Reverend Sharpton and the National Action Network and all of the conveners that actually are here today. And most of all, these families that have been impacted by police brutality and misconduct. So we've come to bear witness, to remain awake, to remember from where we've come and to carefully consider where we're going. Whether you're here in person, online, or watching on MSNBC and other networks, thank you for joining us for this March on Washington. Together, we are taking a stand, and we're taking a giant step forward. Let me also thank Al Green for the very, very warm introduction, my dear friend. But we're taking a step forward on America's rocky but righteous journey towards justice. August 28th is a day to remember the triumphs and tragedies that have taken place in our historic struggle for racial justice. Today, we commemorate the March on Washington to Jobs and Freedom in 1963, where my father declared his dream. But we must never forget the American nightmare of racist violence exemplified when Emmett Till was murdered on this day in 1955 and the criminal justice system failed to convict his killers. 65 years later, we still struggle for justice, demilitarizing the police, dismantling mass incarceration, and declaring and determinately as we can that black lives matter. In our struggle for justice, there are no permanent victories. For on this day, 12 years ago, I was honored to address the Democratic National Convention in Denver. And on that night, in that evening in the Mile High City, our spirits were soaring as the Democrats nominated Barack Obama, who would go on to become the first African-American president of these United States. But the progress we celebrated then is imperiled yet again. 
And now we must march to the ballot box and the mailboxes to defend the freedoms that earlier generations worked so hard to win. In so many ways, we stand together today in the symbolic shadow of history. But we are making history together right now. We're marching with the largest and most active multi-generational, multi-racial movement for civil rights since the 1960s. From high school students to senior citizens, black as well as white, Latino, Asian American, Native American, Pacific Islanders, Americans are marching together, many for the first time, and we're demanding real, lasting, structural change. We are marching together for time-honored goals and in timely ways. We are courageous, but conscious of our health. We are socially distant, but spiritually united. We are making, masking our faces, but not our faith in freedom. And we are taking our struggle to the streets and to social media. The nation has never seen such a mighty movement, a modern day incarnation of what my father called the coalition of conscience. And if we move forward with purpose and passion, we will complete the work so boldly began in the 1960s. We're marching to overcome what my father called were the triple evils of poverty, racism, and violence. And today, those evils have exacerbated four major challenges that currently face our country. First, COVID-19 tragically has killed more than 175,000 Americans, disproportionately African-American, and Latino and low-income people in every background. Second, more than 30 million Americans are unemployed again, disproportionately people of color. COVID-19 has laid bare the structural and racial inequalities in our economy that kept too many people trapped in the debt and poverty. Third, police brutality and gun violence are killing so many unarmed African Americans. Today, we march with their families and we say their names. George Floyd, Boham Jean, Breonna Taylor, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Yusef Richardson, Terrence Crutcher, Trayvon Martin, Ahmad, Ahmad, Ahmad uh, Avery, Aubrey, Elijah McClain, and so many others. And fourth, our voting rights are under attack. We must vigorously defend our right to vote because those rights were paid for with the blood of those lynched for seeking to exercise their constitutional rights. They were paid for with the blood of civil rights workers, such as Sammy Young, Jr., Goodman, Swerney, and Cheney, Jimmy Lee Jackson, Viola Luizzo, James Reed. Those rights were paid for through the sacrifices made by heroes such as C.T. Vivian, Fannie Lou Hamer, Hosea Williams, and John Lewis. But since the United States Senate has failed to renew the Voting Rights Act, we have had to overcome a whole new trick bags of tactics to suppress our votes discriminatory voter ID requirements, cutbacks in early voting and vote by mail, voter purges targeting those who have missed several elections, and disenfranchising those who have served their time and paid their debt to the society. And now COVID-19 is making it dangerous, even deadly, to stand in line at polling places. We shouldn't have to risk our lives to cast our votes. We need to be able to do what President Trump does, vote safely by mail. But now we are struggling to overcome the dismantling of the U.S. Postal Service for the express purpose of suppressing our vote. With all these threats to our lives and liberties, our challenge is to use this moment to expand this movement, a movement that not only raises its voice, but casts its votes pursues its vision, and makes lasting change. The scripture says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Our vision is best express, expressed by a phrase we must never forget. That is the beloved community. 
with those words my father, John Lewis, Ella Baker, Rosa Parks, and so many other historic women and men envision an America whose dramatic practice is as good as its promise, an America where the triple evils of poverty, racism, and violence will be replaced by peace, justice, and shared abundance, and where hate and fear finally give way to help and love. To achieve that America, we need to raise our voices and cast our votes. Over the weeks ahead, culminating on Election Day, we need to vote as if our lives and our livelihoods, our liberties depend on it, because they do. No person, no people are more keenly aware of the risk of disenfranchisement than those who have suffered from it. There is a knee upon the neck of democracy, and our nation can only live so long without the oxygen of freedom. The strength must be exercised by more than rhetoric and more than marching. The simple challenge before us is that everyone can cast a ballot, and everyone who can must cast a ballot. And that ballot that is cast must be counted, and the result must, must be transparent and known to the whole world. And so today, I can call on everyone with the means to drive people to the polls, to make a plan for yourself, for your family and your neighbor, for those organizations and companies that care about democracy. I call on you today to offer your resources and your capacity to make sure every ballot is to count it. If our forefathers were willing to die for the right to vote, we can work for the right to vote. And I will continue to call on you to act in the coming days. You know, my father was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee, while standing in solidarity with poor working people, sanitation workers, whose slogans, I am a man, was a statement that they were human beings with rights that should be respected and acknowledged. They were asking for safe working conditions, for a living wage, for recognition of their union, and for human dignity. They summed up their struggle with those four words, I am a man. That simple but powerful slogan impairs movements today from Black Lives Matter to Fight for 15 and to the Me Too struggle against sexual harassment and abuse. Movements of marginalized Americans are still trying to claim the dignity they've been denied. Martin Luther King Jr. fought for the dignity of work, and that fight is never ending. In 1963, the March on Washington demanded jobs and freedoms. In 1968, the Memphis Sanitation Strike workers and de demanded and the Poor People's Campaign insisted that working people should not live and labor in poverty. Those fights foreshadowed our struggle today to make the minimum wage a living wage, not a poverty wage. And we are fighting alongside the frontline workers, sanitation workers, healthcare workers, grocery workers, transport workers, food service workers, and so many more. They are praised for being essential, but they are treated as if they are expendable. While standing with sanitation workers in Memphis, Dad said, so often we overlook the work and the significance of those who are not in professional jobs, of those who are not in the so-called big jobs. But let me say to you tonight, that wherever you are or whenever you are engaged in work that serves humanity and is for the building of humanity, it has dignity and worth. Now we have a president who confesses greatness with grandiosity. But my father knew better. Everyone, he said, can be great because everyone can serve. He understood the human yearning for recognition. And in his famous speech, he explained that everyone wants to be a drum major, the leader of the marching band. And he challenged us to channel our drum major instinct into becoming drum majors for justice. While we honor our history, we must be living a living movement, not a monument. If Dad were here today, I'm sure he would implore us not to deify him or selectively quote him when convenient. He would want us to be drama majors for justice, to champion the ideals he promoted, racial justice, social equality, and peace. And he would gently but intently challenge us not to dwell upon the past, but to live and labor in what he called the fierce urgency of now. So if you're looking for a savior, 
get up and find a mirror. We must become the heroes of the history we are making. And us means all of us. In 1963, after my father spoke, Bayard Rustin, the architect of the march, asked the participants to join in demanding that Congress pass strong civil rights and voting rights laws. More than half a century later, we must demand that the United States Senate stop blocking passage of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Restoration Act. And so when we conclude today, let's remember that it Remember that it, this is the commitment march in the spirit of 1963. I ask you to join me in pledging to act in three ways. First, because our civil and human rights are at stake in this election, I ask you not only to register and vote, but make sure that at least one other person registers and votes. Second, I ask you to commit to service and struggle in your community, from voter registration to raising the minimum wage to demilitarizing the police. Get involved with one or more of many worthwhile struggles in your community. And third, I ask you to pledge, as my father and John Lewis did, to get into good trouble and do it nonviolently. Remember that in the fight against injustice, nonviolence doesn't mean passive acceptance. It means peaceful resistance. We must come together and join with the Black Lives Movement to raise our voices and say enough is enough. We must come with the Poor People's Campaign, the Climate Change and Environmental Justice Movement, the Women's March and Me Too Movement, the Parkland Students and March for Our, no uh, uh, March for our Lives, and say enough is enough. Martin Luther King Jr. famously said that the moral arc of the universe is long but bends toward justice. But he was also the first to say that it doesn't bend on its own. We must do some work ourselves. In the final year of his life, he wrote in his last book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? Well, my sisters and brothers and dear friends, in this defining moment for our history and our country, we must answer Dr. King's question. Will our answer be chaos or community? I believe some have chosen the answer with chaos, including the current occupant in the White House today. But we who believe must choose community, because if we choose community, we can avoid watching the dream turn into a permanent nightmare. If we choose community, 50 years from now, people will say that we were able to redeem the soul of America and begin to fulfill the promise of democracy by systematically eliminating systematic racism and exploitation. My friends, if we choose community, we will be able to answer in the affirmative to the scripture. Here comes that dreamer. Come, let's slay him, and we shall see what will become of his dream. Finally, this afternoon, I want to say to you, not only do I come as a protester, but I come as a victim. My daddy was killed when I was 10 years old. Gunned down, you know that, by assassin's bullet. Some of you know, but may not know. Six years later, my daddy's mother, my grandmother was gunned down in the church while playing the Lord's Prayer. So I understand what it means to lose a loved one. But I'm so thankful that my grandfather and my mother and my aunts and uncles taught me about love because granddaddy used to say, I refuse to allow any person to reduce me to hatred. The man that killed my lovely wife and the man that killed my son, I refuse to allow them even to reduce me to hatred. I love everybody, I'm every man's brother. If we're gonna resolve these issues in America, we've gotta to come together. Dad talked about it in that sermon, Levels of Love. He talked about all of them. I'm only going to talk about the highest level of love. That love that seeks nothing in return. That love that is totally unselfish. You love someone if they're young, you love them if they're old. You love them if they're black, you love them if they're white. You love them if they're Native American. You love them if they're Hispanic or Latino American. You love them if they're African. 
You love them if they're Asian. You love them because you know that God calls you to do that. And if we're going to resolve all of these conflicts and crises in America, we got to find a way to do it in love. Thank you and God bless you. And let's keep on keeping on. Hello, 57th March on Washington. I'm Joy Ann Reed from MSNBC, and I wish that I could be there with you today as Reverend Al Sharpton is my colleague, my friend, my off-the-record pastor, and my big brother. I arrived in East Flatbush, Brooklyn, New York in 1986 at age 18, having left when I was two. It was an era when Black Lives Matter meant Michael Griffiths, Yusuf Hawkins, Sean Bell, Amadou Diallo, Patrick Dorisman, and Gavin Cato. It meant the Central Park Five and the replacement of New York City's first black mayor, David Dinkins, with Giuliani time. A stay away if you're black Bensonhurst and Howard Beach and Reverend Al Sharpton, who was the only one who seemed to know what to do and who cared enough to do it. A generation earlier, it was Jesse Jackson, and before him, Dr. King. But for my generation, it was Reverend Al. Little did I know that many years later, I would get to know Rev as a local producer and host on Radio One, when he was our big national host, and that he would become my colleague at MSNBC and a great mentor, supporter, and friend. Meanwhile, the National Action Network has never stopped working, even as the names have changed to Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice, Freddie Gray, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Jacob Blake. I marched with Rev in Selma when he pulled me to the front of the line so that I could be there to witness history and John Lewis's second-to-last public appearance. And I've watched him nurture grieving families as they cry out for justice. He has marched on presidents and had presidents confide in him. He has inspired me to use my gifts to make real change. And he has been our backstop and our defender in dark times. We know that when we call him, he will be there and he will do something and cause something to be done. 57th anniversary march on Washington. Please join me in saluting our defender and my big brother, Reverend Al Sharpton. No justice, no justice, no justice, no justice. What do we want? What do we want? What do we want? When do we want it? 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 All right. 57 years ago, in 1963, there was a struggle in Birmingham, Alabama. There was the assassination of Medgar Evers, the head of the Mississippi NAACP, in the middle of struggle and murder, they came to Washington to demand that the federal government give them a Civil Rights Act and voting rights. They marched that day in a hot, blistering day like today, saying that as we struggle, we need legislation. And they stayed on that movement until they got the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. They came young and old. They came from the South. Many of them couldn't stop on the road to use a bathroom because it was against the law, but they came anyhow. Many of them couldn't stop and eat in a restaurant. They had to put their sandwiches in a paper bag because no restaurant would serve them because it was against the law, but they came anyhow. Many of them couldn't rest in a motel overnight, but they came anyway. 
because it was against the law for them to stop. Because they came in 63, we were able to come back in 2020, riding whatever we wanted to ride, stay in whatever hotels was available. They opened the door for us, but there's still some doors we have to open and some people we've got to straighten out. 2020. Twenty twenty, we must deal with those that want to rob our right to vote. And even though we are here in the midst of a pandemic, socially distancing, telling y'all to distance, and I'm keep saying spread out. We want to come to show with our bodies that enough is enough. When I was headed to George Floyd's funeral, I talked with Martin III, and I said, you know, maybe we need to go back to Washington. He said, well, let's talk it out, Reverend Al. As I was giving the eulogy, I announced this march. We didn't know how we were going to do it how we were going to plan it, how many would come, but we did it. Why are we in Washington? I talked with one of the leading minds of our nation, Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, and he told me that, Reverend Al, you've got to understand that until there's federal legislation, every state will do what it wants to do. We have passed in the House of Representatives the George Floyd Policing and Justice Act. Yeah. Now we need to pass that act in the Senate. We need Mitch McConnell and the U.S. Senate to meet on the George Floyd Policing and Justice Act or we going to meet you senators at the poll in November 3rd, whether we got the mail in, walk in, ride in, crawl in, we want our bill passed. Several weeks ago, John Lewis, an outstanding congressman, made his transition. Last time Martin and I were here, he was with us, John Lewis. He and Reverend Hosea Williams and Amelia Boykin were beaten on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, tear gassed, that led to the Selma to Montgomery March that got us the right to vote. And that right lasted till 2000. And 13, when they took and gutted out the middle of that bill, taking away the map. Well, we come to Washington saying, how do you memorialize John Lewis and allow the bill that he stood for us to die? We want the John Lewis voting rights bill for the Congress. So we didn't just come today to have a show. Demonstration without legislation would not lead to change. We didn't come out and stand in this heat because we didn't have nothing to do. We come to let you know if we will come out by these numbers in the heat and stand in the heat, that we will stand in the polls all day long. They keep telling me about how it's a shame that black parents have to have the conversation with our children. 
how we have to explain if a cop stops you. Don't reach for the glove compartment. Don't talk back. The conversation. Well, we've had the conversation for decades. It's time we have a conversation with America. We need to have a conversation about your racism, about your bigotry, about your hate, about how you would put your knee on our neck while we cry for our lives. We need a new conversation. Oh, we didn't come to start trouble, we came to stop trouble. You act like it's no trouble to shoot us in the back. You act like it's no trouble to put a chokehold on us while we scream, I can't breathe 11 times. You act like it's no trouble to hold a man down on the ground until you squeeze the life out of him. It's time for a new conversation. I wondered why. I asked Dr. Dice, why did they have the march at Lincoln's Memorial? Why didn't they go to the Jefferson Memorial? Why didn't they go to the Washington Monument? And he told me, you got to understand, Reverend Al, 100 years before 63, 1963 was 1863. 1863, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. He promised us full citizenship if we fought to save the Union. He promised us 40 acres and a mule. We never got the full citizenship. We never got the reparations. We come to Lincoln because you promised, Mr. Lincoln, and the promise has been broken. And we come like Dr. King came 57 years ago to say we are tired of broken promises. Some say to me, Reverend Al, y'all ought to denounce those that get violent, those that are looting. All of the families have denounced looting. What we haven't heard is you denounce shooting. We will speak against the looting, but when will you speak against wrong police shooting? I remember Reverend Dr. Y.T. Walker sat Reverend W. Franklin Richardson, who spoke today, and sat us down and said that after the Montgomery boycott and they had gone to Albany, Georgia, and the movement stalled because in Albany they treated them with a certain kindness. They said they wanted to find someone that would demonstrate the raw disregard for rights. And as they did, they went all over the South. And Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth told them to come to Birmingham because there was a police chief there named Bull Connor. And Bull Connor would act in an insensitive and brutal way. Well, in 1963 and 1964, they fought Bull Connor. Here we are in 2020. We've gone from Bull Connor to Bull Trump. We've gone from a mean-spirited sheriff to a mean-spirited president whose lips drink with the words of interposition and nullification. We do not want to be disrespected 
How do you speak while this young man, Jacob, lies in a hospital and you won't call his name? How do you sit while Breonna Taylor is in a grave and you won't call her name? How do you sit while Eric Gardner is in a grave and you won't call his name? How do you sit while George Floyd is laying in a grave and you won't call his name? Well, Mr. Trump, look right down the block from the White House. We come to Washington by the thousands. We gonna call their name. We gonna call their name. We'll never let America forget what you done. Call their names. This is the time, this is the time for legislative change. This is the time for us to vote like we never voted before. And don't just vote for the top of the ticket. Vote all the way down. Go down from the top to the bottom. Vote all the way to the dog catcher. We want to get rid of anybody that's in our way because our parents died to give us the right to vote. You can mess with the mail, but it ain't the sacrifice that Goodman and Cheney and Swerner gave. Our vote is dipped in blood. Our vote is dipped in those that went to their grave. We don't care how long the line, we don't care what you do, we're gonna vote not for one candidate or the other, but we're gonna vote for a nation that'll stop the George Floyds, that'll stop the Breonna Taylors. They say when George Zimmerman was acquitted for the murder, When he was acquitted for the murder of Trayvon Martin, three young genius sisters wrote the slogan, Black Lives Matter. And it resonated. Why did it resonate? Because too long, you acted like we didn't matter. They said, well, everybody matters, but everybody hasn't mattered the same in America. Reason we had and still have to say Black Lives Matter is because we get less health care like we don't matter. We go to jail longer for the same crime like we don't matter. We get poverty, unemployment, double the others like we don't matter. We treated with disrespect by policemen that we pay their salaries like we don't matter. So we figured we'd let you know whether we tall or short, fat or skinny, light skin or dark skin, black lives matter. And we won't stop until it matters to everybody. Let the sister, if she want to hold up her fist, leave her alone. Let me say, as we hear from some of the victims, and as we get ready to march over to the King Memorial, 1963, Dr. King talked about he had a dream. Today, we heard from his heir and his son 
Martin Luther King III, his beautiful wife, Andrea, and his granddaughter, Yolanda. And they are in the bloodline, the children and grandchildren of the dreamer. But we come in the same spiritual lineage because I want this country to know that even with your brutality, you can't rob us of our dreams. Your bigotry can't rob us of our dreams because we've always had the dream beyond our circumstance. We always had the dream of being what we were not allowed to be. We are the dream keepers, which is why we come today black and white and all races and religions and, so and sexual orientations to say this dream is still alive. You might have killed the dreamer, but you can't kill the dream because truth crushed the earth shall rise again. We gonna rise never to fall again. We gonna stand up even when our legs are tired. We gonna make this dream come true. Let me say this. Let me say this as we close. I want everybody to be orderly. Let me say this. We all should leave here committed to keeping this dream alive. I want everybody that went to the website of National Action Network Net, nationalactionnetwork.net, that wants to help us on election day be poll watchers to protect our vote. I want you that will be signing up. Early voting starts in two weeks. We on a nonpartisan way want to put people all over this country. They want to suppress our vote. We've got to have foot soldiers that will protect the vote and that will be out there. And I want you to say to yourself that you could have been so much more. You had ideas and dreams not only as a race, but as a person. But society had their knee on your neck. We could have developed and been as successful as others, but society had their knee on our neck. But we're not going to lay and submit no more. We're not going to take it. Some have different tactics, but we all are rising up. You're going to get your knee off our neck. If we got to march every day, if we got to vote every day, we will get your knee off our neck. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. No justice. No justice. No justice. No justice. All right. I want to bring out. I want y'all to back up. I want y'all to bring to my left is the mother of Breonna Taylor. Where the other family? We got the Where they at? We got the Acevedo family. We got the We got the Blake family. Say her name. Say her name. Say her name. Say her name. Let us hear from Tamika, the mother of Brianna Taylor. Uh, hi, everybody. First, I just want to um, thank everybody who's been uh, in support of getting justice for Breonna Taylor. Uh, 
second, I just want to, uh, I got to thank Louisville, Until Freedom, my family, and most importantly, Kenneth Walker for coming out here and continuing to say her name louder. Um, what we need is change, and we're at a point where we can get that change, but we have to stand together, we have to vote. I'm good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, uh, that's right. Say her name. Say her name. Say her name. All right, wait a minute. Shh. I brought Mr. Lincoln all of the broken promises. We all stop when a man was killed with a knee on his neck, narrated his own death on videotape and didn't know they were recording. But his death has been the impetus of a global movement. I bring you his brother, the brother of George Floyd, Fionis Floyd. Thank y'all. Get my sister Bridget, my attorney Tony Ramanucci, my wife Kita, my sister Tanya, my nephew Brandon. Your brother. Your brother. Your brother. Sarah. Okay. All right. Hey, I'm so overwhelmed right now. What everybody's here right now. Man. Man, no. Hey, I, I wish George were here to see this right now. That's who I'm marching for. I'm marching for George, for Brianna, for Ahmad, for Jacob. For Pamela Turner, for Michael Brown, Trayvon, and anybody else who lost their lives or are too evil. I got you. It's never been more clear than change right now. It's happening right now because we demand it. Everyone here has made a commitment because they wouldn't be here for no other reason right now. It's hot. And I know it's hot, but as of now, we here because we are being fried right now, man. Man, really, I'm trying. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I got it. I got it. I 
got it. I got it. Yeah. I, I got it. Uh, as of now, everybody out here right now, our leaders, they need to follow us while we're marching to enact laws to protect us. Man, I, it's hard, man. It's really hard. I'm, I'm so sorry, man. Man. My brother George, he's looking down right now. He's thankful for everything that everybody is doing right now. Y'all showing a lot of empathy and passion, and I'm enjoying every last bit of it right now. If it weren't for y'all, I don't know where I'll be right now because y'all are keeping me running. I have to advocate for everybody, man, because right now, Jacob Blake, I'm feeling, it's hard just to talk right now. Shot seven times, man, with his kids. That's painful. I'm Bridget Floyd, George Floyd's sister. I want you guys to ask yourself right now, how would the history books remember you? What will be your legacy? Will your future generations remember you for your com complacency, your inaction? Or would they remember you for your empathy, your leadership, your passion for weeding out the injustices and evil in our world? You know, Martin Luther King stood here 57 years ago, and he told the world his dream. But I don't think y'all know that we're here right now and have the power to make it happen. I don't think y'all hear me, but we have to do it together. We have to do it together for our generations to come, our children. My brother cannot be a voice today. We have to be that voice. We have to be the change. And we have to be his legacy. Thank you from the Floyd family. Now, shh. wait a minute, y'all too close to each other. Y'all stretch your arms out and stretch out now. I know we outside and you got on a mask, but don't get that close. Y'all spread your arms and social distance. Y'all too tight up here. 
bring up the next family. Next family, let's go. He said we need to bring up the next family, so we need to move. A few days ago, a few days ago, okay, all right, go ahead, go ahead, yeah, go ahead, okay, go ahead, Quincy, come on, sisters. Give a hand to Floyd family as we get ready. Please have one speaker. Shh. Now, y'all are too loud. Why are you screaming? Now, a few days ago, I got a call and talked to a father whose son was shot in Kenosha, Wisconsin, seven times in the back while he was running into his car, policeman had the edge of his t-shirt. There was no weapon in his hand. There was no threat to the policeman. By law, a policeman should only use deadly force when they are on a life extenuating circumstance. What could have been the circumstance? when a man's running away from you? What could have been the circumstance when a man is trying to get in his car? Now they say they may have found a knife in his car. Well, did they examine the police to see if they had x-ray vision to see through the car door? When he shot him, he didn't know what was in the car. What he knew was that a black man seems to be expendable and we come to say we are no longer expendable we are going to demand justice his mother and father are both here his mother got a little heat exhaustion and is sitting in the tent but I bring you the father of this young man who we are all rallying for. This is Jacob's daddy, who said to me, I'm gonna fight for my son. I'm gonna fight for justice. Let's welcome to the platform, Jacob Sr. Hey, we need to make way. Jacob Blake, say his name, say his name. Say his name. Say his name. His, his sister's going to first speak for the mother who's here in the tent. America, unapologetically, I am here to tell you in front of the world that you got the right one. God has been prepared me. America, your reality is not real. Catering to your delusions is no longer an option. We will not pretend. We will not be your docile slave. We will not be a footstool to oppression. Most of all, we will not dress up this genocide and boo and call it police brutality. We will only pledge allegiance to the truth. Black America, I hold you accountable. You must stand, you must fight, but not with violence and chaos. With self-love, 
Learn to love yourself, black people. Unify. Group economics. Black women, you are your brother's keeper. I know it's heavy, but forgive him and heal his manhood was taken from him a long time ago. Build him up. Black children, read, learn, grow, and live and question everything. Black men, stand up. Stand up, black men. Educate yourself and protect the black family unit, period. No justice. No justice. No justice. Jacob Blake. Jacob Blake. Jacob Blake. There are two systems of justice in the United States. There's a white system and there's a black system. The black system ain't doing so well. But we're going to stand up. Every black person in the United States is going to stand up. We're tired. I'm tired of looking at cameras and seeing these young black and brown people suffer. We're going to hold court today. We're going to hold court on systematic racism. It's going we're, we're going to have court right now. Guilty. Yeah. Guilty. 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 Racism against all of us. Guilty. 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 Racism against Trayvon Martin. We find them guilty. guilty. Racism against George Floyd. We find them guilty. guilty. Racism against Jacob Blake. Abdul Dawala. If I said the name wrong, Allah forgive me. Guilty. guilty. And we're not taking it anymore. I ask everyone to stand up. No justice. No, no justice. No I met this man when I was seven years old. How did I know I was going to meet this man again in these circumstances? I truly did not want to come and see y'all today for these reasons. My father was in town for the first march on D.C. I have a duty. I have a duty to support and understand each one. I love everybody in this crowd. I love you. If nobody told you today, Big Jake loves you. But we're going to stand up, baby. We're going to stand up together. I need your strength. Big Daddy's legs ain't that good anymore. I need your strength. No justice. No peace. No justice. No peace. I love y'all. I want to bring attorney V.I.V. Lamont, who represents these families. Then I want attorney Stewart to come, who represents others. There are many families here, and I think we should hear from a few more before we march to the King Memorial. Good afternoon, DC. I'm attorney B.I.V. Lamar. I represent the Joel Acevedo family who was killed in the city of Milwaukee by an off-duty officer before George Floyd and was strangled for 10 minutes. I also represent the family of Jacob Blake who was unhumanly just killed, shot seven times, but he lives today.
At this time, I want to just thank Reverend L. Sharpton and the National Action Network for having this event here today, because action is what we're here for. I'm going to tell you right now, we're tired of talking. We're tired of talking. We're tired of playing games. 2020 is the year that America is going to be put on timeout. We thank the Milwaukee Bucks. And all the NBA teams who sacrificed their game for this special cause. We thank the Major League Baseball. We thank all the actors, entertainers, celebrities across this country who utilize their platform for justice. Today, I just want to let you know, this is the last season of the police version of How to Get Away with Murder. We know your playbook. We know your plays. Step one, claim that you in fear. Find an object or an action and say that you in fear so that you can justify killing a black or brown person. Step two, assassinate that black or brown person. And then step three, you assassinate his character. Then after you get to step four, you delay your investigation. You, you exaggerate it. You got the video that takes 20 seconds to watch, but you take two, three, four, five, six months to say you're still investigating. And then when you call an uproar around our community, then you attack our protesters that are gathering peacefully and take any extreme and use tear gas against them. I want to let you know we're here today because game is over. This timeout is not in vain. We know your plays, and it's over. It is training day for police officers and law enforcement agencies across the country. It is training day. If you don't train your officers on the standard operating procedures and get them racial bias training, the great civil rights lawyers of this country will hold you accountable. And I'm going to let you right know right now, it's not going to be cheap because black lives matter. I want to thank you right now all across this country for standing up for justice, standing up for this very important cause. The time is now to take change. And we're not going to stop until we get it. And we're going to shut it down if we don't get it. If we don't get it, if we don't get it, thank you. No. Yeah, I'm real, I'll stay there. Two minutes, two minutes. Uh, now I'm going to bring up the family of Joel Acevedo, another case in the state of Wisconsin where an officer strangled an innocent man for 10 minutes. Ooh. <clears throat> Let us free. We need to be free. We are free people. I come down here to let everyone know and let these governments know as well that we have rights. And if there's not going to be no justice, there's never going to be no peace. I love that this is what God wants our brothers and sisters to stand in one and unity with the Hispanics, Asians, every different nationality that is standing here that is standing for right. Joel Acevedo did not deserve to die. He was my son, invited to a police party where there was drugs and alcohol. The city of Milwaukee's been hiding this case. They choked him for over 10 minutes in the officer's house, Michael Mattioli, along with his two accomplices that they want to use as witnesses, Andrew Jokowski and Eric Mr. Peterson, I tell you right now, America, wake up, because you're going to get a rude awakening. And we come against you, Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ. We stand for what's right. Thank you. I love you all. As we bring on Attorney Stewart, 
and the family of Ahmed Aubrey. Hold it. We're trying to get everybody in. As we get the next set of family members to come forward and then prepare to march to the King Memorial. Many athletes and artists have stood for justice. One of them said, I'm coming to sing for the family. May we hear from internationally acclaimed artist B.B. Winans. No justice! This song I wrote after the death of Freddie Gray. My son at the time was 15 years old. And all I remember was seeing my son's eyes in Freddie's eyes. And I went to the piano and I wrote a song, not just for my son, but for every son and every daughter that's represented. Black lives matter. I said black lives matter. Black lives matter. Tomorrow, hope to see his eyes looking back at me with that smile, his possibilities and our plans don't take away from me. With your hands at night, I close my eyes and I pray, Lord, cover him with love and your grace. How can you know his heart, my friend? When already judged him by his skin, see it's the right to live that we're after. Wanna trade my tears, my tears to laughter, cause in one moment. One moment dreams are shattered. Our sons and daughters matter. Yes, black lives matter. Oh, oh. So let my words resound clear with hands lifted high and revered urgently regard dispel fears in hope of saving lives that we hold dear yes we do see it's it's the right to live that we're after we must trade our tears our tears for laughter cause in one moment in one moment dreams are shattered our sons and daughters they matter
home to see my son eyes my son eyes looking back at me B.B. Whining Attorney Stewart I'm attorney Chris Stewart with attorney Justin Miller and I bring you words and thanks for the support that y'all have given us in all of our cases. On behalf of Gianna Floyd, the daughter of George Floyd. On behalf of Rashard Brooks and Tamika Brooks is in the crowd. On behalf of Walter Scott and Alton Sterling and all of the other names. The support is because of the community here. Because of Rev, because of Lee Merritt, because of Ben Crump, because of all of the people that are standing up and fighting. 57 years ago, we were standing right here, trying to fight poverty and oppression. That illness has not changed. There has been no vaccine for racism. There's been no quarantine for police brutality. And that's what we're here for today, because we're all the cure. All of these families up here, their children are not victims. They're the vaccine. Thank you for your support. Continue to fight, because without you, we're nothing. Let us hear. Attorney Merritt is bringing the mother, the sister of Bath and John, killed by a policewoman who said she thought it was her house. Let us hear from his sister. Hello everyone, my name is Elisa Findley. I first want to thank the National well Action Network. <laughs> I would like to thank the National Action Network, Reverend Al Sharpton and Martin Luther King III for organizing and convening this march. Botham Ja is my brother. September 6th marks two years since I last heard his voice, heard his laugh, two years since my family has felt whole because September 6th will be two years since Amber Geiger shot my brother through his heart. Both of them died while sitting at his home, eating ice cream and watching football. He was minding his own business. Since then, I have been on a mission to seek reform to the severely broken justice system because both of them would still be alive today. Instead, we are nine days away from the second anniversary of his murder. Two years of saying his name and Antoine Rose's name. Ten years of seeking justice for DJ Henry. Four years of saying Terrence Crutcher's name, saying Chantel Davis, Delron Small, Sandra Bland, Tatiana Jefferson, and so many others. I am tired of learning new names, adding new hashtags to an already, lit, already long list of victims of police terror. We cannot allow our brothers and sisters to only be remembered for how they died. We need to continue to push for change so that their lives were not taken in vain. We are all in this together. We are our brothers and sisters keeper. Thank you. The mother of Ahmed Aubrey, young man jogging, shot down in cold blood in Georgia, Brunswick, Georgia. Give Wanda a big hand. I stand before you as the proud mother of Ahmad Aubrey. I'm carrying a very broken heart, but also a grateful heart that God chose my son, Ahmaud Aubrey, to be a part of this most huge movement. I do believe if we continue to stand and fight together, that we will get change. That's right. 
sadly, we, we have these type of tragic events far too often. But I want each of you to please don't forget their names. Please let their names live forever. I want to share three words with you that I know Ahmad would want me to share with you as well. And that is, I love you. I love you all for standing with us. We love you. I also want you guys to help me chant his name and maybe he'll hear it in the heavens. Say his name. Amar Amin. Say his name. Amar Amin. Thank you and I love you. I can skip. I can skip. You don't have to do me at all. You spoke, man. No. Oh, go ahead. In one minute. Let us hear from Lee, attorney Lee Merritt. Black power. I said black power. Black power. Look, we cannot be afraid to stay black power. You cannot say that black lives matter if you don't believe in black power. Black power. The only way we stop this from happening is when we begin to exercise our own power. I've been hearing a lie from the Republican National Convention all week, and they keep telling me that this man freed the slaves. Let me tell you something. Lincoln didn't free no slaves. We freed the slaves. We free ourselves when we fight for ourselves, and we fight for ourselves through black power. Say it with me, black power. Black power. Say their names, Atatiana Jefferson, Jamel Roberson, Ahmaud Arbery, both of Jean, Oscar Grant, Seville Smith, DeAndre Yarber, Terrence Crutcher, and so many names we can't, we can't say them all, but listen, when we say black power, that means it all. So one more time so they hear you in the White House. Black power. Let us hear from the father of Ahmed Aubrey. One thing, I just want to thank God for all support for my son and his mother. I just want to say it's been a hard road because my boy been lynched by three white men. And it's been a hard road for me and my family. And uh, sometimes I find myself saying, I can't believe it. But it's real because I sit back, I'm used to my boy calling me every day and tell me he loved me. And sometimes I be like, wow, he forgot to call me. And it, it just ain't real, I can't believe it. So I sit back and say, my boy gone, he's not coming back. So me and his family got to be his boys now. And we got to keep on fighting. And I'm gonna fight, cause I'm here to fight him. I'm not gonna stop till God call me home, right? More power to the people, and thank y'all. Can, can we also say the name Trayvon Martin? Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin. Please welcome Trayvon Martin's mother, Sabrina Fulton. our hero, our shero, Sabrina Fulton. There she comes, Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin. Sabrina Fulton. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. 
I just want to say, even though we're going through a crisis, even though it looks dark, I want to tell you to be encouraged. I want to tell you, in spite of what we go through, be strong, stand tall, be encouraged. Don't stop saying Black Lives Matter. Don't stop peaceful protesting. Don't stop praying. Don't stop uniting. Stand together. This is what this is about. We was built for this. And last but not least, I want to leave with you my favorite Bible verse. It's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. So regardless of what you're going through, trust in God. He's the only thing that matters. Stand up, people. Stand up. We was built for this. Keep fighting. Amen. Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin. Let's give a round of applause to Sabrina Fulton. All of these families for their strength and their courage. Another brother who the NYPD killed, Eric Garner. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. We have now Eric Garner Jr. And if you all would let her make her way to the rostrum, Eric Garner's mother, Gwen Carr. Come on, Eric Garner Jr., give him a round of applause. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. It's been six years since I, my father's words became our words. We have to make a change. I'm challenging the young people to go out and vote. It's possible for a change. We just have to put in the work. Go out and find out what we have to do and what people we have to vote in to make a change. We had to march peacefully. I don't want to see no looting. I don't want to see no, no nothing. Just march peacefully. I'm Eric Gardner Jr. That's my message. We have the mother of Oscar Grant, ladies and gentlemen. Just a word, quickly, please. Rhonda Johnson, ladies and gentlemen. Rhonda Johnson. Good afternoon. I want you to know that this race is not given to the swift, nor to the strong, but to the one who endures. And we are a fighting people. Michael says, Michael 6 and 8 says, what does the Lord require of you? To walk humbly and justly. And when we think about justice, we look at us as a people, we have not received the justice that we deserve. And it's gonna require each and every one of us to continue to band together, to continue to march, to continue to protest, to continue to call the injustices unjust. And you, as a people, we as a can people, can make it happen. We can change some of the laws that are before us. If we band together, I have with me my brother, Cephas Johnson, Uncle Bobby, and we are here to fight till the end because we know, we know from Oscar's case, only 11 months in the county jail, where is the justice? Where is the justice? We look at liberty, and liberty is in balance. And until we as a people begin to fight like we are fighting on today, like Martin Luther King had that dream, and so we must have the dream that we're going to see equality of all people. I am Oscar Grant. Say his name. Say his name. Say his name. Say his name. Louder, say his name. All right, we love you. We got a couple more out of respect. We just need everyone to bring very brief greetings. 
so we can line up to march. The mother of Dontre Hamilton, give her a round of applause. The people have the power. We will show up on November the 3rd to take our country back. We will show up November the 3rd to take our family back. I am Dontre Hamilton's mother. He was shot 14 times for sleeping in a park. I will never stop fighting for you. Let's fight together. Vote. Hold on, hold on. Sisters, sisters and brothers. Mike Brown mother is here. Where is she? Sisters and brothers, let me just say this. The problem is, the police have killed so many of us, there's not even enough time for us to hear from every family. But I'm going to acknowledge the families that are around me, just acknowledge who's here. The family of Stephon Clark is here. Hold your fist up, brother. The family of Michael Brown is here. There's Leslie. Come stand next to me, Leslie, just so people can see you. The family of Seville Clark is here. Seville Smith, I'm sorry. The family Terrence Crutcher's twin sister is here. Um, who am I leaving out? David Jones is here. Am I leaving anybody out? Who? Philip, Philip Pinnell, the family. The family of Philip Pinnell. Antoine Rhodes. Montez Hambrin. Is are you his mother? The mother of Montez Hambrin. Look. Emmanuel Lee. There are there you see all the names that are being called. We want to pray for all of these families. Pamela Turner. Pamela Turner. Tamir Rice, please. Niles Arrington, please. Please follow the instructions of the marshals and begin to line up to my right. As we begin to march. Y'all all right with one more, Leslie? Yeah, Everybody Les, good? Leslie's going to speak. Yeah, and then Stephon Clark going to speak. Um, I'm well, gonna, no, I'm not doing all that. We're doing too. We no, we're not. Stephon we're not going to do any. Yes, we're we gonna, no, no, we can't do it, bro. There's no time. We got to we gotta march. We got to march. Move to the... You're on TV, though, brother, Stephon. You're on TV. I've never seen you more than once. Yeah. I know. You're on camera. Okay. We didn't come out of California now. All right. On my mama kids. You need it. So let's let everybody... Let's let everybody line up. You can see the crowd shifting to the right. Let's make way for these families to lead the march. You can get over there and maybe you can jump on the mic over there. All right? I'm sorry. It's just one person after another. It's coming, brother. Who? T Tony Robinson? And then I gotta let everybody speak, and we don't have time. I know, but she might be speaking right now. But she's been here since this morning. That's Reverend Sharpton's decision. I know he he flew us in for that Hi everyone, I'm Lana Zach. You've been watching the speakers from the March on Washington for racial justice and police reform. It comes 57 years after Martin Luther King Jr. led his march there and gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. Today, the families of black Americans shot or killed by police are speaking on the same site at the Lincoln Memorial. This year's march has been dubbed by organizers, Get Your Knees Off Our Necks. It follows months of mass protests against systemic racism and police brutality sparked by the killing of George Floyd, and more recently, the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin. 
Dr. Peniel Joseph is joining us now. He's the founding director of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin, where he's also a history professor. So Professor Joseph, that's where I'd like to start with you now. Can you give us some historic context? We heard obviously Martin Luther King quoted several times. We heard John Lewis quoted several times. What did you hear or see today that reminded you of the original March on Washington? Yeah, I thought there was a lot of um, stress on love of country. Uh, it's very interesting that um, the NBA coach Doc Rivers said he was exhausted from loving a country that doesn't love us back. But this idea that centering racial justice, centering black lives is actually um, centering American democracy and building the beloved community that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. talked about that Wednesday, August 28th, 1963. So in a lot of ways, um, this march is a very, very patriotic march. It's a very, very hopeful march. Uh, it's a march that is talking about black humanity and centering black humanity. And in doing so, we center all of our humanities. Um, so it, it's very, very hopeful. Um, we do have this generational opportunity right now to end systemic racism, uh, to defeat white supremacy. But violence has always been a part of this country. We can think about racial slavery and the Civil War and um, Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, and even the Civil Rights Movement with John Lewis. John Lewis was the victim of violence in 1961 as a freedom writer um, and also in 1965 in Selma, Alabama. Uh, so we want peace. We want justice. But like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said in a letter from Birmingham jail, um, he really criticized those who wanted um, an unjust peace over disruptive calls for justice. So we have to remember that the only reason people organize and demonstrate is not because they want to, but because they have to. They're trying to build and perfect the union and build that beloved community. And what Dr. King said about a beloved community was that it was a community free of racial injustice, free of economic inequality, and free of violence. So that's the community that we want for all of our children, um, for all of us in this country. Well, you've written that some of the key takeaways from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech have been overshadowed. Would you mind talking to us about the vision that King laid out for American democracy on August 28th of 1963 and how some of those political seeds are showing up right now? You know, King lays out an extraordinary vision and a future-looking vision for American democracy, but he says that we're going to have to all struggle together and sacrifice together. He says that we come here to cash a check, a check that has been stamped insufficient funds, but we refuse to believe that the great vaults of opportunity in America are bankrupt. He also says that now is the time to make real the promise of democracy. He talks about racial slavery in that speech, but he talks about it in a way that we have to look towards the past to move forward. He says he dreams of a day where the sons and daughters of descendants of enslaved African Americans and the sons and daughters of those who owned African Americans could sit down together at the table of humanity. So it's, a, it's an extraordinary speech, but it's a speech that says that we have to face the past to move forward together. And in that speech, he talks about the racism in Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, but also in the North. And he says, we're gonna have to struggle together, but we're gonna have to go to jail together, black and white. And it's important for all of us to remember, before this present moment of 2020, we had 250,000 Americans, 90,000 white Americans joined with black Americans to go to the March on Washington and to stand at the Lincoln Memorial and say that they wanted to build another country together. So it was a new beginning for all of us. And so when we see 20 million Americans out on the street in 2020, the origin story there in the immediate context is 57 years ago, we came to march, to march on Washington peacefully to say that the country had to change so that it could move forward. And that struggle continues in our own time. Well, Professor Joseph, you know, I'm, I'm remembering, um, if I'm remembering my history correctly, uh, Congressman John Lewis, when he spoke at the March of, on Washington, uh, was told to 
toned down his speech, his original remarks, so that it was politically acceptable um, to people who uh, maybe were on the fence or were skeptical of the movement. I'm wondering how you feel like speeches now compare with it. Do you think that people are toning down their rhetoric in order to win over supporters that might be skeptical or those days are done? You know, I think it's a combination. I think John Lewis, even with the speech that he ended up giving, it was a very, very uh, combative speech. He says that uh, the South is going to be shattered uh, to a thousand pieces and remade in the image of God and democracy. So these speeches that we've heard today are very, very um, truthful. They're speaking truth to power. But I'm sure people are still leaving things unsaid, uh, some of the speakers, because they want to build unity. But they're, this idea of Black Lives Matter which is was a controversial uh, slogan seven years ago. Suddenly we have um, public polling that says people understand now. So the only way you can bring people along is by speaking your truth. And a lot of times people's truth can be offensive, but we have to keep pushing forward because uh, those of us who are not an able body, those of us who are not black or Latinx or a woman or a trans woman or gay or queer or undocumented, the only way we can understand those folks is by empathizing with them, leading with vulnerability, and being being willing to listen to their truths. And that's what the, Dr. King ends that I have the dream speech by saying that it's when we come together and build that beloved community, the 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 song the the lyrics of my country tis of thee, a sweet land of liberty, will take on new meaning. So King is making this argument that the only way we can come together and really understand the founding documents, but also these 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 tributes to American democracy and America being liberty's surest guardian is by actually living up to our creed, right? And so the idea of justice should not be something that makes people fearful or panic. It should be something that says that we are are this world's last best hope, right? Is the United States of America because we protect the weak. Uh, we are for and on the side of the underdog, and we're for human rights for everyone. That shouldn't make anyone fearful. It should make us all proud to be Americans. So what we're seeing in Absolutely. Washington today and in 1963, we're being called to our highest, most aspirational level of citizen. We are all citizens. And if we lead with deep vulnerability and empathy for others, people who we don't know, that's the highest calling of all Americans. Well, Professor Joseph, I want to play some sound from Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. Listen to this. We are in unprecedented, uncertain times. We are challenged by the state of the nation and the crisis we face, but the state of our movements, it is strong. And another world is possible. Yes, it is possible to legislate justice and accountability. People over profits, joy over trauma, freedom over fear. Yes, it is possible to write budgets that actually value black lives. If it feels unfamiliar, that's because it has never been done in America. We will meet the moment. We will work towards healing, justice, and collective liberation like our lives depend on it, because they do. We heard her say, we will meet the moment. Uh, I'm wondering if very briefly, because we only have another couple of seconds left, you can tell us about how you feel in this moment, being a black man, being a professor, a scholar of history, and looking out at, uh, at this march on Washington. You know, I feel very hopeful, Lana, and I think that Ayanna Presley, this is a brilliant speech. And black women have done so much to bring us to this period. Black feminist women, black queer women, black trans women. Um, and Ayanna Presley is really standing on the shoulders of the Ella Bakers and the Shirley Chisholms. And without black women organizing fiercely um, and loving this country and all of us uh, so greatly and courageously, we wouldn't be at a point where we can talk about race, class, gender, sexuality, and say that. Uh, when we center the least of these in this country, we um, aspire to our best self, right? And so 
I think that she is a tribute to this country. Um, and this march is a tribute to people who really love America um, as an ideal um, and, and as an aspiration uh, rather than something that's just mythological and something that doesn't really matter. They're trying to put our creed into practice. Uh, and this is what Dr. King said uh, at the March on Washington, too, when he says now is the time to make real the promise of democracy. This is the opportunity that we all have. All right, Dr. Peniel Joseph, thank you. <laughs> thank you. We're going to take a quick break now, but stick with us. You're streaming CBSN. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah, the more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, anytime, anywhere. It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBSN Los Angeles, streaming 24-7. CBSN Pittsburgh, your neighborhood news, streaming 24-7. Anytime, anywhere. Find it on KDKA.com and on all your favorite devices. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Absentee voting is great. You request, I'm an absentee voter because I requested, I got, and then I sent in my vote. So that works out very well. That's what we've had. But now they want to send in millions and millions of ballots and you see what's happening. They're being lost. They're being discarded. They're finding them in piles. It's going to be a catastrophe. As November rapidly approaches, President Trump has begun to delegitimize the outcome of the 2020 election, already casting doubt. In recent weeks, the president bolstered his efforts to condemn the use of mail-in voting. President Trump claims that the Postal Service is riddled with security flaws, which would allow fraudulent ballots to be cast on behalf of the Democratic Party. Last weekend, President Trump took to Twitter to voice his concerns, saying, quote, so now the Democrats are using mail drop boxes, which are a voter security disaster, among other things. They make it possible for a person to vote multiple times. Also, who controls them? Are they placed in Republican or Democrat areas? They are not COVID sanitized. A big fraud, he writes. In turn, the social media giant labeled that tweet with a warning, saying that it violated the company policy about civic and election integrity. Additionally, Twitter took steps to restrict other users from sharing, liking, or even replying to the president's tweet in an effort to crack down on misinformation posted on its platform ahead of the election. But while Twitter is ramping up its efforts, there are growing concerns regarding Facebook, which fell victim to Russian meddling in the 2016 election. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg has continued to hold fast to the importance of freedom of speech. However, with the company's history of allowing misinformation to remain on its platform, Facebook has two challenges. It must now prepare for not only foreign interference leading up to the election, but they also need to have a plan for the president potentially turning to social media to challenge the results. CNET senior producer Dan Patterson joins us now to discuss this. 
Hey Dan, good to see you. So back in 2016, Russian operatives used Facebook in order to meddle in the presidential election. As November approaches, what has Facebook done in order to prevent tampering ahead of the 2020 election? Good to see you too, Lana. So after the 2016 election, Facebook did a number of things, including uh, opening an advertising portal so that the ads, especially the political ads, uh, became part of a searchable database. Uh, they've also, what they say, uh, tripled the amount of uh, content moderators who are in charge of uh, finding and labeling political content. Um, and they have cracked down on disinformation and misinformation algorithmically. Uh, now, when I say that they've hired uh, additional content moderators, they say it's over 30,000 people. Facebook has just about 50,000 employees. So most of these people are, in fact, contractors, uh, many of them through a company called Cognizant. And uh, The Verge, CNET, and other outlets reported last year that many of these content moderators were very poorly paid and they were forced to stare at pretty horrific content for very long periods of time. They enjoyed none of the same benefits uh, or training that Facebook staffers do. So uh, Facebook has done some things, but uh, the, the other things that they've done, they've been pretty opaque about uh, beyond press releases and uh, their PR people pitching us. Hmm. Well, as we discussed, there are growing concerns over the way that President Trump could respond after the ballots are counted. Is Facebook re preparing any kind of response in the case that he tries to delegitimize the outcome of the election? Or does that seem to them something that's, uh, that they don't need to be thinking about at this point? Yeah, they are, Lana. Uh, they have built what they call a kill switch for political advertisements. However, we should note that Wired, as well as other outlets, has said this is too little, too late, and that, look, it is highly likely that this won't be decided on Election Day, uh, and that banning political advertisements or, or enacting this uh, kill switch of political advertisements after Election Day uh, is, uh, to paraphrase, too little, too late. Well, we've heard uh, Republican officials, White House officials, try and draw a line between uh, the, the president's criticism of universal mail-in voting and just the legitimacy of mail-in voting ahead of the election. But we have heard the president on social media criticizing the legitimacy of mail-in voting at multiple levels, including in that tweet that I just read to our viewers. So Twitter hid one of his tweets earlier this week, flagging it as a violation of the company's policy about civic and election integrity. What is Facebook doing to prevent this type of misinformation from appearing on its platform, and is it enough? Well, Lana, uh, to that point about mail-in voting, I actually spoke to Chris Krebs, who is the nation's top cybersecurity officer at the Department of Homeland Security. He said mail-in voting, totally safe. Um, Facebook is, uh, they are labeling content now, and they did uh, start to tamp down on misinformation and disinformation starting in July. Um, but there is this ongoing debate that uh, well, do we? What is free speech, especially in a private platform where Congress there there is no First Amendment issue here? And Facebook's own employees, according to BuzzFeed, have been outraged at Mr. Zuckerberg's uh, kind of failure to enact policies that resemble what Twitter is and other social platforms are doing. So I'm not saying what's right or what's wrong, but there is a huge schism happening inside Facebook right now about these very issues. And of course, people uh, who think less kindly of the social media giant feel like their business model thrives when this type of misinformation and heated exchange take place. All right, Dan Patterson, thank you. Great to see you. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is stepping down as leader of the country because of declining health. CBS News foreign correspondent Imtiaz Tayab reports on what this means for the country as it deals with the coronavirus pandemic and other tensions. Well, after a week of breathless speculation across Japan following two recent hospital visits, Shinzo Abe announced he's stepping down as Prime Minister. Abe suffers from a form of colitis, which is a chronic condition that also led him to resign during a fairly brief term as Premier back in 2007. Still, today's announcement comes as something of a surprise. We have to remember, for eight years, Abe has steered Japan through turbulent economic headwinds and tricky geopolitical fault lines, not least President Trump's Asia policy, 
particularly on North Korea. Now, Abe also stands out as one of the few world leaders who not only worked hard to forge a relationship with the president, but also to a large degree succeeded at it. Since 2016, the two leaders have golfed together multiple times, met often, and exchanged phone calls quite frequently. According to Mr. Trump himself, Abe even nominated the president for a Nobel Prize. Whatever the case, at home, the outgoing Japanese premier will also be remembered for trying and failing to revise Japan's pacifist constitution, implementing major economic reforms that pulled the country out of recession, and his crowning achievement, a successful bid for the 2020 Olympics, something that still hasn't been realized after the Games were postponed because of the pandemic. Now, as Abe resigned, the coronavirus was central to his message. Japan was one of the first countries hit by COVID-19, and he's been accused of responding too slowly to the outbreak. Now, the deputy prime minister will now take the helm uh, until a new leader for the right-leaning Liberal Democrats party is elected. And although Shinzo Abe is leaving office earlier than expected, he does so while making history. Just this week, he became Japan's longest-serving premier in modern times, a title previously set by his great-uncle, Isaiko Sato, more than half a century ago. Lana. Next on CBSN, anger, frustration, and calls for change. Following in the steps of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., thousands take to Washington in protest. We'll hear from some of the powerful speakers from today's commitment march. And he says it's about more than just basketball. Why one athlete passed on some of the top basketball programs in the country in favor of a historically black university. We'll be right back. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah, the more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, anytime, anywhere. It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBSN Los Angeles, streaming 24-7. CBSN Pittsburgh, your neighborhood news, streaming 24-7. Anytime, anywhere. Find it on KDKA.com and on all your favorite devices. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. One of the country's top high school basketball prospects is bucking the usual trend of committing to a powerhouse sports school instead choosing to play for historically black Howard University. According to 24-7 Sports, McCour Maker was one of only 28 five-star recruits this year. He turned down offers to play at powerhouses Kentucky and UCLA, instead heading to D.C. Maker explained his decision in an interview with CBS Money Watch reporter Christopher Brooks. You know, I'm bringing awareness to the contributions blacks have made to society. You know, when you look at Harvard, I mean, you look at Howard University, you know, it's a great business school. You know, it's the alumni base is, you know, phenomenal. You know, Kamala Harris, the politics, everything, everything's, everything's prestige. But on the athletic side of it, I think five-star recruits should, you know, consider HBCU seriously, like what I've done. And when I went on my Howard visit, you know, it, 
you know, I went over there and it was, you know, it was, it was a great 